Welcome to another episode of The Greatest Pod, where we discuss and debate what makes something great. I'm Ron Swallow. I'm Ed Greer. And I'm producer Bill. And today, we are going to talk about the greatest sports movies. Now, we know it might alienate some parts of our audience, but a lot <laughs> of us like film. A lot of us have dabbled in sports, and sports is an intriguing thing to depict on film. It, it, it has everything from the triumph of the will to the underdog story, all the things we like about fantasy and science fiction stuff. So I think it's germane to uh, to our oeuvre to talk I, about the greatest sports movies. I think sports movies are essentially superhero movies with no powers or very, very scaled down powers in the case of something like Rocky. Yeah. Yeah, I do, too. And I also think they're underdog stories, which I personally feel like nerds should relate to, because to me, a lot of the best sports movies are underdog tales uh things that make you go like root for the the guy who couldn't make the team but pulls off making the team or you know don't you bring weird... rudy into this conversation this early i mean screw that <laughs> screw that noise i'm not even talking about that i'm talking about the ragtag bunch of weirdos who pull off being whatever team it doesn't even matter what the team is a lot of times those ragtag team stories are great stories that make you just feel good because you're a weirdo you know what i mean mm -hmm. and we should almost say up front there are almost like two categories of sports movie there's like the kid sports movie and mm -hmm. like the the professional sports movie which i guess yes. would also encompass you know like uh college sports and what have you but like the sports movie can be a lot of different things to a lot of different people with a lot of different tones. So I, I think this will be a fun conversation in so much as we're going to all have some left field choices. And Ron, just hearing you talk about those great underdog stories, I'm going to have to throw out one of my favorite of all time right away, The Sandlot. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Everybody loves The Sandlot, dude. <laughs> I don't know, man. I think it's also a little bit like the time you grew up in. Like that movie came out. I'll be honest. I also have a soft spot for Little Giants, which is like yes. a TV football uh, movie. That's, that's one I was going to bring up, and I'll we can <laughs> talk about it a little more at some point. But like, let let's get into the Sandlot for sure. Just because, what an interest. Like, look, I know that a lot of people probably think this is a cheesy choice or it's the easy choice, but it's also <laughs> actually good. Oh, it's a good like it is a movie that holds up. Um, Although I can't say that from the standpoint of like a kid nowadays, because when we were growing up in the night, uh, me anyway, when I was growing up in the nineties, the fifties, when this movie takes place, were enough in like living memory to connect. But now in, in an era when kids have grown up with smartphones and tablets and the internet, their entire lives, I don't know if the fifties just seems too passe to even be relatable. All that said, we we of a certain age, at least, definitely all have memories of being out raising hell with our neighborhood friends sometime before high school. You know what I mean? Like those summers where you're just running around being little shits. Even if you don't like baseball, you can relate to that part of the movie, I would think. Oh, yeah. I mean, the jumping over the fence for the beast to get the ball, that's... That's classic kid trouble. Like, you know, you make up a scenario, you make up all these things, and does it, does the scenario that you're about to go do, m like, meet the legend? Well, that's the thing. Like, I think, and I, there was a time when I was producing reality TV, I wanted to do this as a show, but we never got it going, was, um, like, local urban legends or, or suburban legends, right? I think growing up, you know, in or around any sort of like the outskirts of a city where we're kind of where the farmland starts to meet the neighborhoods and you're not really dealing with, you know, city growing up in a city, which I think is its own thing. In, in any suburb, you have these legends, these, these, you know, myths I still remember like the haunted roads and there was a haunted bridge and all this stuff that's like so specific to your time and place. And I think the Sandlot just indulges in all of that. 
Yeah, well, I think the interest and the most interesting thing about the Sandlot because like it's not one of my things. I was probably too old for it when it when it first came out. But it's like if you took Stand by Me and just they're not gonna go see a murder. They're gonna go <laughs> fuck around on the Sandlot and say right. you're killing me, Schmalls, and all this shit. They're they're doing all these cutesy. St- it's like a cute version of how dangerous everything felt, how important everything felt as a kid like every game was life or death every dog was the biggest fucking thing in the world every fence had unnamed horrors there be dragons might as well be on every tall fence that you saw as a kid you know what i mean there it's this sense of adventure because you don't know anything and when you combine that with a sports movie you get a singular classic like i said you they took some carburetor out of stand by me and put it in a sports bill well and i think in a larger sense that's what sports will do for you in a movie in general, is it gives you real palpable visceral stakes without having to make things life and death. You well, know what I mean? Absolutely. And and here's something funny. Uh, talk about life or death uh, and how people uh, overplay things. And in, in New Mexico, uh, when I was a kid uh, in the early 1990s, I don't remember exactly when, but there was this big news thing where they found a satanic symbol in and made out of this weird yeah. hexagonal thing and made out of tires and and some like metal kegs and stuff. And then it turned out that it was a game that a bunch of weirdos had made up in the 80s that was a mix of tag and soccer uh, <laughs> and that they bounced on the tires from tire to tire and you had to kick through things and stuff like that. They just made up a game. It was called like turf ball or something like that. Some Some weird ass game, but like, that made me think about that, like urban legend. These kids just made up a game because that's what was lying around and they wanted to play a game. Half of the sports that we all play are all something like that anyways. Mm. So I just find it fascinating that that happened. And and I think that that's these little things like that are actually where we get these big movies and this thrilling, like, I don't know, legends. So anyways. Well, but when you really quick, as just the dumbest aside ever, when you're a kid, yeah. you can make up a game. And yeah. that is what's so dope about childhood. It like harnesses that childlike athleticism and, you know, uh, naivete into this potent mix. I remember me and my buddies, we didn't make up a sport. We weren't sedentary kids. He was very athletic. He went to college and did all that shit. But we made up a game on a rainy day. We were sitting in the house and we had two chapsticks and two <laughs> pencils. And we got at one end of a giant table and put up our chapstick like as a in between you know in the middle of the table and then we, the other person would put up their chapstick we would try to hit with the pencil the chapstick all the way across the table to hit the other person's straight up standing chapstick oh, yeah. and that fucking thing got rough that it, <laughs> it, 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 <laughs> that game got so fucking serious dog and it was and we had our own techniques we had our own like no nah, no nah, you sh- you you judged it you know we don't allow zhuzhin. What the fuck was that? I don't know, and I don't remember. But there was some, you know, way to do it that we had decided was was gauche. So you had to do it this other way. We just had our own little rules, our own styles. Like, it was great. It's like uh, like shooting free throws, uh, granny style. That's like, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> or bowling granny style. I do that too. That's. Uh, that's dude, I favorite. just went to a bowling alley, and the number of motherfuckers who chuck the ball about six feet and it lands somewhere in the middle of the bowling alley and then starts rolling. I kick those motherfuckers out instantaneously. <laughs> That's hilarious. But you know um, what? All this is circling this this point of like sports is the ultimate expression of like being part of a subculture, right? Yeah. Like there are both hard and fast rules and mm. these kind of soft mores like, you know, tossing the ball too too far in the air when you're bowling that everybody kind of agrees on. And if you transgress, God help you. And I think maybe even bigger than than the idea of the sports movie, I think that a lot of that is what makes sports in general such rich, such a rich place for storytelling. Like it basically functions the exact same way as like a tabletop RPG. Like you're, you're working within these narrow seemingly arbitrary very hard to like explain or understand until you do it rules and you're trying to to win within that context and winning doesn't really mean anything to the real world but when you're in that pressure cooker it means everything and i think that's awesome 
Well, and let's talk about Little Giants then, because I think that that's actually a great conversation point for Little Giants, mm. because Little Giants represents a lot more than, you know, the ragtag football team going up against the 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 well liked more pay you know had better players football team, which is kind of on its surface what it's about. It's also about sibling rivalry, mm-hmm. right out the gate because you have. Um, Who's, who played Al Bundy? What's his name? Ed O'Neill. Ed O'Neill and... Um, Rick Moranis. Rick Moranis. Ed O'Neill and Rick Moranis <laughs> playing brothers. And Rick Moranis doesn't want to be a coach per se, but his daughter wanted to play football. And they were like, no, girls don't play football. And a couple of these other kids wanted to play football. And they were like, you're not good enough to play on this team. And they were like, you know what? We're going to make a team out of this girl and the one guy we got who's good and you bunch of goofballs who probably shouldn't be doing this anyways. Right. So it was also the original woke disaster, you know, a girl playing football. I mean, come on. Yeah. What? what? <laughs> the They're like all monster. anime characters. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, and let me talk about one of my favorite scenes in that whole thing is when, uh, the guy goes and I think he hurts the quarterback or he just does something crappy in general that pisses off the girl. And then one of the coaches, like the semi uh, assistant coaches is, says something along the lines of like, like, Oh, that's gonna, that's gonna teach her. And, and, and Al Bundy's characters like Al Bundy's character. That's hilarious. He's Al Bundy to me, by the sure. way. Uh, he's like, he's like, no, you just pissed her off. And then she just starts destroying people. <laughs> well and he knows because she's his niece i think that yeah. was what's again it's interesting how these movies from the 90s have a lot of the rough edges sanded off because in that movie you're right it is about sibling rivalry but that also allows the sort of like life and death underdogs have to take out the the big dogs to get a little bit cuddlier because it's yeah. like oh they can reconcile and oh he's he actually loves the girl He just, you know, is too set in his old fashioned ways to let her play football, but he knows she's talented and he knows she's athletic. And I just think that's funny because all these movies can be traced back to the Bad News Bears with Walter Mm -hmm. Matthau in the 70s. And that's a movie where like he was just an unrepented asshole and those (laughs) kids were assholes back to him. (laughs) And like that, that sets us down this track in sport in kids sports movies that eventually leads to like the Mighty Ducks, the Sandlot, um, you know, whatever the, uh, wow. Um, the movie we were just talking about, Little Giants, Little Giants. Mm-hmm. Heavyweights. Like there was just this this slew of movies. I think it must be off the back of Mighty Ducks success, but like the 90s were just replete with these like warm and cuddly versions of the Bad News Bears. Yeah, I think it's I don't know, man. Uh, uh, George Carlin had some choice words for he would he called it the pussification of America. (laughs) I'm not going to go that far, but I will say there is kind of this weird um, sports as this gladiatorial thing kind of has started to go away. And I wanted to save this for later. But I think what's interesting about if somebody's listening to this episode and they don't quite know why they are because they don't like sports and stuff. It's part, I do believe, of the the like lessening of all this outdoors, just go run out, go play, fuck off. There's so much less of that because of all this supervision and stuff. And yes, if you're really into sports, it's at a higher level than it's ever been in regards mm-hmm. to like how early you can get specific training, how early you can get into teams that don't even have nothing to do with your school. You could play four years of great basketball and never touching your high school court <laughs> because mm-hmm. there's AAU, there's all this different stuff. You could go to a college preparatory academy that teaches you specifically how to go to the NBA instead of going to fucking regular high school or college. That's how much they're preparing kids. But then you get this thing. I saw this Twitter thread, and I know Twitter is for for evil purposes to get you to react to stuff. But I read this this guy. I think it was a guy, but it might have been a lady who put up her kid goes to this door to look and see if she made the team, whatever team it is. She doesn't make the team. She comes trotting back to the car crying. They take a picture of the girl looking at her name, not on the list, and a picture of the little girl trotting back to the car crying. And they go, my girl didn't make the team, and that's messed up. 
But when I was her age, you know, I can't even relate because I used to make all the teams. But then again, <laughs> I used to run outside and and play all the time. I didn't just kick it looking at TikToks all day. So maybe, you know, I and so I just said, hey, cry, do your thing. But, you know, work on yourself. Get your shit together. <laughs> but I was just like, oh, my God, that's so fucked up. But also, like, it wouldn't even be an issue back in the days. My fat ass was outside 14, 15 hours a day when I was a kid running around yeah. doing shit. I mean, my at my fattest, I was ruining kids at playground basketball. I could play playground basketball for six hours at my fattest as a kid, wrecking yeah. kids. You know what yeah. I'm saying? And it's just, I don't know, man. I think that's kind of lost, and I think we're going to see less and less to all that talking was to lead to. I think we're going to see less and less of the sports genre being a movie thing. How many real sports movies that are around kids have come out and been successful in the last few years? I don't. No, really I mean, see the, the last sports movie I can literally think of was on Netflix, and it was Hustle, and I only watched it because it was Adam Sandler, and I was giving it a chance. And then, well, I mean, not I, not counting Creed. Yeah, I was going to say yeah, I think no. Creed. You know, Creed three counts as a sports movie, but specifically, I think Ed, you're talking about those sports movies that are like about and starring kids. Kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just funny because now, you know, for, if you're an 11 year old, you're, you're coding and taking Brazilian jujitsu on the side. You yeah. know, you're not out, you're not out playing stickball uh, in the, in the sandlot. Yeah. And, and on top of that, like, and look, I don't know how true this is in other states and stuff like that, but I know in, in some states they're doing things like not having scores and they play sports now in let's some not places. Be old. Let's not be old men, though. I mean, like, I... No, I no, but like... let me say something. Yeah. I'm cool with that. Like, I, I'm just saying. I, I'm I, cool with that. Here, you, here's, you just... here's my only thing, and look, I'm not I've got being a lot that of old. I know, yeah. I know. I, this isn't yeah. directed at you at all, Ron. Yeah, yeah. I, I just... I, this is a, obviously a trigger for me, being a sports guy from a sports family. Like, yeah. when I was in junior high adults were complaining about, well, some schools don't even keep score and things are getting so, you mm -hmm. know, you, you can't even hit somebody in football. Oh, that's a good point. And that was fucking almost 30 years ago, man. Like I, it has not changed that much since I was a, a preteen playing sports up till now. And I guarantee you it didn't change that much in the previous 30 years. There's just something about like old people love to think that things were tougher in their day. And I'm not I'm not sitting here saying that kids don't spend a lot more time on their ass looking at screens. But I also remember spending a shit ton of time on the floor looking at the TV when I was a kid. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I well, think I think, I think my, my thing is from a sports from my limited sports background and from what I've seen of like the new youth kids. Yeah. I just think your average kid playing sports is almost gone. Your kid who wants to play sports. They're going to play the fuck out some sports with all the specialized right. training and all this super pressure, even when they're six fucking years old. But your average kid don't want to sign up for that anymore, I don't think. And I don't think, you know, teams were for your average kid ever, honestly. No, for sure. I think part of that, though, is like and this this is where we bring it back to our conversation. I think some of the mystique of sports is gone. Like, mm, mm. you know, when we were kids, there was a little bit. I think most parents had that twinkle in their eye of like you might win the lottery with sports, right? Mm -hmm. Like it might just so happen that my kid is a phenom and just loves it and picks it up and like takes off to the stratosphere. And I think in the modern era, more people are understanding like my kid could be a phenom if I'm like Tiger Woods dad or the Williams sisters dad, or like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. If you take it seriously and turn it into a job for the kids, then yeah, maybe they could be Tom Brady or whomever. But it's like that that sort of simple, you know, almost almost fictional notion of like, you know, you do it for the camaraderie, but it could just take you somewhere amazing. It's the Rocky story, right? Like, I think people have become disillusioned to that especially yeah. parents it's like i know kids skating have not i well, can tell you that like i don't know about the other sports but i've still every once in a while will roll around a skate park and hear the kids talk the kids the children's mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they still say things like yeah dude i'm doing this i sent a video to you know such and such skate company i'm hoping i get sponsored you know all all, all that stuff is still still there but like 
at the same time, they also know that they could just become a TikTok star. <laughs> well, right. Doing I mean, that their changes, that changes the whole uh, um, the equation. Well, well, it changes the whole equation too because I'm also aware of like there are kids who have become like baseball, football, basketball five star recruits because they were just posting all like the shit that they do well on mm -hmm. TikTok, on Facebook, mm -hmm. on Instagram. Yeah. It, it, and again, it just, it makes it feel like a business though. You know what I mean? Like yeah. when, when we what? were kids playing sports, it was just the thing you did in the neighborhood. And now it feels a little bit more like the same corporatization that has kind of swept over everything in America. Yeah. Well, and to that end, my favorite sports movie going into stuff that I like because I don't like little giants, little morons running around, stupid sandlot, 50s. Get out of here. I like blue chips because oh, blue yes. chip is serious motherfucking business about what we were just talking about. The commodification yeah. of children, the stealing, the theft of the joy, the, the theft of like. You could you could find some podunk kid that's born in your hometown and he just goes to your school just because and you guys could become a national powerhouse. That's gone. By the time that kid is 11, everybody from Sri Lanka to Antarctica knows who this kid is and some big school is going to snatch him right out of your little hometown. And there's nothing you could do about it. And if your boosters have enough money, you could get them to go anywhere. Mm. And that just that poisoning of the so-called um, purity of, of sport. That's what that movie's about, and I love it. And it's got some of the best depictions of sports ever. Those motherfuckers was really playing some Bassett Bow. Well, I mean, you've got Shaq and Penny Hardaway in that cast, right? Like that's, mm -hmm. and then Nick Nolte fucking murders that role. Yep. Like Nick Nolte as sort of the cutthroat college recruiter, or was he an NBA recruiter? He was a college recruiter, right? Yeah, he was a he was a college recruiter, and he was on a team that had its glory days, but had gone fallow. And the new boosters had come in, and they were going to try to oust him and stuff. And in order to save his job, he broke every covenant he ever had in his whole life. Yeah. And that's kind of the arc of the story, you know, and, and whether or not he's going to break all those and win and keep going or whether he's going to reject that. But like, God damn, I just love that movie. And just the, uh, I think one thing that uh, is good about both the movies you guys mentioned, I was just Josh and Sandlot and Little Little Giants. They have good performances from kids. Mm, yeah. And I think that, you know, obviously Shaq's not a child and and uh, nor was Penny Hardaway. Penny Hardaway hasn't even gone to college yet. And Shaq mm -hmm. was just barely about to get into the pros or whatever, or he was barely on Orlando at the time. And he actually, due to his scrimmages in that movie with Penny Hardaway, told his general manager, pick Penny Hardaway to go with me. And they're like, come on, man. Oh, Chris Webber's on the board. This guy's on the board. These all these super great players on the board. No. Yeah, I've scrimmaged with this guy. His name is Penny Hardaway. Get him. And they <laughs> they did. They did. And it That's turned out happened. pretty good. It sure did. I did oh, not let, know that. I, look, I'm sorry to interrupt this, but I do want to talk about one scene from Little Giants before we go back to this. I just mm -hmm. have to talk about it because, okay, I want to say this. One of the, my favorite things about any genre movie is really what they can do is take these, like create these emotional moments that, that you relate to. Uh, one of my favorite moments in Little Giants is after the quarterback is injured and he can't throw the ball anymore, they have to come up with some different ideas and the kid starts making plays and blah, blah, blah. And at one point he hands the ball off to this one kid, the kid who's been having problems with his dad the whole movie. And then the kid goes, what am I supposed to do next? And then the, the, you know, the good guy goes, I don't know, run to that guy. And he points at his dad who hasn't showed up at any of the games and comes waltzing into the end zone, like to the end of the end zone. And that kid runs through everybody. And I'm telling you, I think I cried at that moment in a movie as cheesy as little giants. I think a couple of man tears poured out my little eyeball because I just got that. You know what I mean? And I think we've all been there where it's like, Oh yeah. You know, when your dad shows up, that's pretty amazing. When parents show up, or, you know, something great happens to you, you you feel that super good moment. And I think, and Blue Chips had a little bit of that, wouldn't you think, Ed? Yeah, I, I think it had that in regards to, like, showing that 
it meant a lot to these kids and their parents. You know, that whole thing about sports being some way to kind of pay your parents back. I mean, the only things I've cried about as an adult is tallying up how much money my mom spent on raising me and how much money I've given back to her and how imbalanced that is. I want to yeah. jump out a fucking window, bro. Every time I think about that shit. And so for some of these these kids, you know, uh, especially single parent homes and all this kind of shit, you're 21 years old. You bought your fucking mom a house in an Escalade. You couldn't tell me shit if I bought my mom a house in an Escalade. <laughs> you couldn't tell me shit. You couldn't. Yep. If I was on fire, you better just shut up and let me burn. I know what the <laughs> fuck I'm doing because I bought my mom a house in an Escalade at 21. Suck a dick. You know what yeah. I mean? So that, that's like such a dream that it was it's embedded in blue chips and it's embedded in everybody's morals in that almost any any anything is justified if it's buying your mom a house. Yeah, I'll do some job wick shit to buy my fucking mom a house. It's interesting how often that comes up in sports movies, because I'm thinking of something as different, you know, from blue chips as the original Rocky, which is as different from um a movie like Moneyball, right? All of these movies, especially the ones that are trying to be real dramas, have to thread in that idea that like making it in sports is the equivalent of like making it in life. Like this is mm. this is the moment that makes everything worth it. You know what I mean? And yeah. you you 100% get that from the guys in in um, Blue Chips. But you even get that like from uh, Chris Pratt's character in Moneyball. You certainly get that from Rocky Balboa. Like there is, and that's why I think that as the culture maybe becomes disillusioned to that promise, um, sports movies lose some of their impact. But like all these classic sports movies are going to have some version of like, this is like winning the lottery. You know what I mean? Like this this solves life in some way being good at this sport. Yeah. Um, it's, it's also one of those things where you're like, I don't know if that's a good lesson though. <laughs> I would argue it's not. I mean, yeah. look, I'll argue from my own point of view as somebody who was very successful in sports and, you know, got a scholarship played in college. I spent pretty much all of my twenties, like unlearning a lot of the lessons that sports teaches you. Because mm. sports is very good, at least team sports. I can't, I never really did individual sports. You know, people tell me that like things like wrestling or MMA, as much as they're about the guy across from you, they're also about challenging your own limitations and blah, blah, blah. All I know is playing football and baseball. It was very much about number one, you do X, Y, and Z to get better. You master X, Y, and Z skills. And that allows you to beat the guy across from you and beating the guy across from you brings glory. And, and um, I, I don't want to say success, but it brings, it brings glory and like an acceptance, right? It, it, you, you were celebrated by the people who care about it. And like life just doesn't really work that way. There's not like a script for, okay, if you, if you can master this list of skills, you can be certain that you're going to come out better than most other people. And once, you know, you're going to have a, a definitive singular opportunity to prove that you're better than those people. And if you if you uh, succeed in that singular opportunity, everybody recognizes it and celebrates it like none mm -hmm. of that shit happens in life. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Well, I think there's a, it's funny that like the military and sports are so up each other's asses. Well, yeah. But but it's because it's the same thing. If you have the tactical skills of a superhero soldier marine or you're an almost professional level athlete, you can still end up on the street. <laughs> you can still end up all fucked up. So it's like it's a pinnacle, yes. But you could end up with a fucking Rambo monologue. I used to tackle guys three times my size. Now I can't get a job parking cars. You know, yeah. there's so many great athletes that have that story. Yeah. So it's like it's this pinnacle of stuff. But and it works. It's like it's like that old joke, right? Dudes who do karate only fight other motherfuckers that do karate. Because it's like you're, you're agreeing to a certain set of rules. And right. then if, so, if a motherfucker jump on you, start biting your balls and shit. Hey, wait, 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 wait. That ain't karate. You know what I mean? <laughs> and life, life takes sports people and soldiers and pretty kids and all types of people who just sort of coast for a while. 
and says, no, 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 no. There's a whole extra layer to life. And sometimes it kicks their ass, but sometimes sports, soldiering, different stuff, being a child actor, some of these things that are just tours of duty as a youth that shape sure. you. Sometimes those things make you come out with an extra set of skills that's super dope, but it isn't guaranteed like it's sold in the movies. I think that's the point. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think that's the greater point is like there's a certain level of crossing the finish line, which in and of itself is something you do in sports, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it it convinces you that there's a finish line to cross. And once you do, everything is OK. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's happily ever after for, you know, more aggro types. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. I wonder how many athletes feel that at the beginning, too, because I, I like. You know, I can't remember as well because, you know, I skated for so long and skating is subjective. And even though it's subjective, but it's also not completely subjective, there are tricks that are harder than other tricks. And if one guy hits every single hard trick in a run and you hit two of the same tricks and the rest of the ones you do are not as hard, you know what I mean? Like there's an obvious yeah. thing, but, but like it's, it's also gets to the point where you're like, okay, I just did this competition onto the next competition. I just did this. Now I'm going to do the next trick. And you, you start, you stop thinking about it as a finish line, but I'm trying to remember my first, I did a, I, I ran a three, five minute miles when I was a kid. And I remember hitting the five minute mark because there was this fucking kid <laughs> who was, uh, I hit it my junior year. There was a kid who was a freshman and he ran, a mile in four minutes and 40 seconds the first time he ran mm -hmm. as a freshman. Mm -hmm. And I was fucking furious <laughs> because well, I had worked so hard and it felt like he had not worked hard. He had just showed up and ran fast. And I was like, fuck. But the thing about it, and normally I'm not like this. I'm not competitive most of the time. Even when I was a kid, I was not very competitive. But in that situation, it made me go, am I not pushing hard enough? And the couple of times I pushed really hard, I didn't get a 440 by any means ever. But I got to a five. And, mm -hmm. it, and it felt amazing when I hit the five. I didn't even care that I didn't get to the 440. But I remember mm -hmm. getting to the five and going, I fucking did that shit and it felt great. And it I think a lot of these sports movies who are great at this, they make you feel that. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and it's a complicated thing, right? Because I do think challenging your own limits and pushing yourself to get better is never a bad thing. Yeah. That said, it maybe isn't a great translation when like the urge to do that comes from contempt and resentment of people that you've never met. And like, that's the sort of thing that you need to unlearn because in the moment when you're competing in high school, you know, whether you're running track or whether you're in a football game or whether you're in a wrestling meet or whatever, like psyching yourself up to hate the fucking other person on the other side no. is a great way to like push yourself. Yeah. But like you can't go through life that way. No. No. And that's says like, you, what? says you, <laughs> fucking loser. I'll yeah. crush anybody. No. I yeah, run you're, a computer right. company and I am worth a billion dollars. That's exactly how I think. Well, well, well I, I mean, just crushing competition, crush your enemies, see them yes. driven before you and hear the yeah. lamentation of their women. It's sure. one of the oldest. I mean, I know that's from Conan, but I'm just saying that that line of thinking is just literally what. It's like what thirty two percent of what got us here, looking at computer screens the, the and flying in outer space. <laughs> let me let me counter that by saying, and I'll bring it back to our to the conversation at hand. This is why Rocky Three is one of my all time favorite sports movies, possibly yeah. my most favorite sports movie, because within Rocky Three, you do get the personal vendetta of sports. Like I need to humble this guy and show him that he's not better than me. But it tempers that storyline with a very, I think, realistic look at the fact that outside the arena, there's no reason to hate the person you compete against. Mm -hmm. And the way that Rocky and Apollo are able to find that common ground and be, you know, and have such a believable sort of meeting of the minds and real friendship that grows between them even as Rocky pursues 
essentially vengeance against Clubber Lang. To me, it's it's this great alchemy where it's like it's essentially teaching you how to internalize sports into life, right? Like winning is not everything and and making the person across from you into something to hate is not healthy. And I think that that move, like that's a little bit of Rocky's entire journey in that movie. And yeah. by the end, it's like, Clubber's the one who starts out look. He starts out looking so fearsome, but by the end, his like single-minded devotion to I just need to embarrass this one guy comes across as like petty and nonsensical in the face of like watching Rocky and Apollo build their respect into a real friendship. I love that. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and I also it also has a thing that I really enjoyed, uh, and I and it's not it's a very simple thing, but it's also just something that I just find totally entertaining in in a and also okay i find it entertaining but i also find it illuminating and here's what it is it's that no matter how what heights you reach in anything that you do there's always more heights to get to and if Mm. you bring other people into your life and allow true friendship to blossom and true you know camaraderie to blossom it's easier to reach those heights Mm. you look at the Rocky one, he just wanted to last. He just wanted to get through that and show that he wasn't a fucking bum. And, and as he fucking the, did that. And by the way, as big of a dick as Paulie was, he always gave him the benefit of the doubt. And as much as Adrian was this shy person who didn't seem to want anything to do with him, he continued to pursue her maybe in a way that's creepy, but it was the seventies. But like <laughs> he really was able to build his life outside of just wanting to win. Exactly. And that that was the real victory. I mean, that's why the original Rocky is also one of the great all time movies. Forget about sports movies. But yeah, that just just adding to your point, Ron. Yeah. And then in Rocky two, now he wants to win and he gets a, enough training and toughness. His toughness has always been there because he is what he is. And he pulls off the win in this scenario against the opponent. He probably shouldn't have won against. We all know that. Mm. And then in three, you get to see him go he's reached these skill levels, but he needs another level. Mm. He needs another attitude and only the friendship of a guy he's, he's beaten is the thing that can bring him up to that. And that is a beautiful thing. And, and I see that in comedy. I see that in art, you you guys pushing each other to, to draw cooler stuff or talking about, this different, you know, style that's happening from other artists and really paying attention stuff. And, and, and I love that sort of thing. That's one of my favorite parts about three personally is I just love, uh, and especially the most important thing that I love is that bro hug in, <laughs> in, in the ocean. Frolicking so, in the foam. Frolicking in the, in the, in the foam. Wearing those yes. half shirts. Come on. Uh, Yes, uh, but but I, just really quickly though, the thing also about Rocky. I mean, I think over the course of this, we are going to come up with our personal list of greatest sports movies. Now, look, yeah. Rocky One has to be on anybody's greatest sports movie list. But I would yeah. say we make the rules. Rocky Three is part of the Rocky appeal, and I'd say arguably Rocky up to Rocky Four. If yeah. you look at those, if you look at that as a quadrilogy, that might be. Uh, mm, putting that up against john wicks one through four (laughs) it's it's a battle for me and i love me some john wick but like the thing about rocky's transformation is that in the third one you find out that maybe just maybe he beat up a kind of slightly gonna go over the hill apollo creed Mm -hmm. and maybe some of these guys he's waxing so easily are tomato cans and maybe All of this, there's another level to get to. No, whatever level you get to, there's somebody doing sit-ups in the dark that's better than you. Yep. You know what I'm saying? And they're going to fuck you up if they get a chance to fuck you up. And it's their job to put themselves in your purview. We've seen boxing. One of the things that killed boxing and made it whack and made uh, UFC flourish was boxers were dodging each other for years. The Mm -hmm. top two guys almost never fought. Mm -hmm. In these movies... You go up to somebody and go, hey, man, hey, hey, woman, hey, woman, come over to my apartment. I'll fuck you good. And Rocky's a shrimp dick and all this kind of shit. And and you just go, fuck it. And now all of a sudden this Mohawk fucker with like 
15 victories gets to be in the championship just like you kind of your somebody gave you an opportunity so he sees that himself just giving a, a young guy an opportunity but he feels like he's he really is rocky and he finds out he's not anything and gets destroyed and then when he goes and does all that training that's great but what if clubber lang hadn't just sat on his laurels what if clubber lang had to work just as hard I'm telling you guys, Rocky would have got knocked the fuck out again, and it would have been yeah. real sad for the Italians. But it, it because have. because of the fact that in sports, right, it's already been shown that in sports, when you get that big, there's a natural relaxation that happens. When you finally get to the top, there's a natural relaxation, and that's when the young guy can come and take you out. So, like, Rocky's just rife with all those lessons, and, like, uh, Rocky becoming a symbol of America – so he became a symbol of everybody in America. He can't beat no more Americans. Right. He'd have to beat. He'd have to beat the Predator. He'd have to beat a spaceship in Rocky IV. So they made one. They made a, a, a mech suit <laughs> with, a, with is, a crew cut from the fight. It is funny though how through all those movies you really do see if you look hard enough the the ethos of it's about more than what happens in the ring because. Yep. When mm -hmm. Rocky turns the tide at the end and the fact that what does he say in the speech? And like, it's on the nose, but it's also glorious. Like I've seen a lot of changing. If I can change and you can change, maybe we all can change. Like that gives me goosebumps. Even thinking it about it now, right now, right <laughs> now, <laughs> because again, it's like that, that series of movies embraces this idea that like, it's not just about what happens when you're competing. It's about what you do with your life on top of that. And like, I mm -hmm. think that is, that's part of its greatness. And you see that continue through the Creed movies too. I think that ethos mm -hmm. remains part of that franchise. Yeah, yep. absolutely. Um, I would like to, before we move on to some, some more stuff, I just, I just want to say this people listening right now, we're going to miss some stuff. I just want you to know that we know that we can't get to every single amazing sports movie that's come out. And there have been a bazillion, but we are going to talk about some of the ones we like the best. Um, and I want to talk about, um, so we've been talking about like ones that move you. And actually, you know, maybe we should talk a little bit more about some, some other ones that move you because we've been basically talking about Rocky for most of this time. But let's talk about uh, some other ones that kind of like move you a little bit rather than uh eventually i'm going to get to some ones that i think are just fun okay. um now ed, you, you got any off the top of the dome ed off the top of my head uh as far as like make me feel something uh teen wolf let's go with teen wolf um <laughs> <laughs> i actually really enjoy teen wolf but yes i see what you're going Dude, i see where you're going with this no but teen wolf is great because it shows you that like look man in the end the team had to win the whole yep. point of with him turning into Teen Wolf was it nullified the whole rest of the team. They literally became non-entities. It was it was hero ball for for use of a proper term. Mm. And in the end, he decides to win the game, having to use his teammates and having to play team ball. And they beat the bigger team guys. I've never felt a, a, a great affinity for Hoosiers. Because if them brothers from the hood had to run some simple pick and rolls, then white boys yep. would have been destroyed. Yep. All right. Really it's just not <laughs> the, the, the basketball choreography in pretty much every basketball movie leaves a lot to be desired. I'll just put it that way. That's why blue chips came up first. I'd yeah. say and let's, let's go down this vein of like because I, I have a strong opinion. It is this basketball, as hard as it is to depict, is still more. <laughs> I don't know. It's more moving to me. It's probably just a matter of personal taste than like a lot of yeah. football and movies. I feel like to make football as dope as it seems, they go so overboard in depicting it. It's like every football game takes place in the darkest night with the most <laughs> driving rain and just dudes are getting detonated and there's no foul on anything. And it, it's just like they go so overboard. It's like every as I mentioned John Wick 15 times. I'm going to do it again. Every football movie takes place in the John Wick verse no, for some I, reason in that final game. I agree with you. I think that in general, football and movies is portrayed poorly, mostly because like, I think it's really hard to put together a director, a cinematographer, and a bunch of actors who all know what it's like to play in a football game. Yeah. And so 
you end up getting a lot of, let's just say, creative interpretation. And, you know, it doesn't always go down well. Football yeah, is and, like- and we didn't talk about Roxy's boxing for similitude either, because, like, <laughs> it's not – those aren't boxing movies. I hope no, nobody goes into those expecting a boxing movie. Yeah. No, the, well, let me extend not- that. Just, just real quick honorable mention, Creed Three has just some unbelievable fight choreography. Like, Michael B. Jordan directed his ass off. But none of that has shit to do with actual boxing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. Well, in, in in fine Rocky tradition. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, I mean, what I think, about what about any given Sunday? See, even any given Sunday, you know, aside from the fact that they're using like Christopher Nolan ass shaky cam. Oh um, yeah, <laughs> forgot about that. I forgot about the shaky cam. You're right. <laughs> they've got some. I mean, they've got some good moments. They've got uh, who was it? Bill Bellamy was playing the wi- the wide receiver in that. I think who yeah. I think was a college football player and he was running some real routes and they had, I forget who it was, but they had an actual receiver. It might've even been T.O. Cause I don't know if he was huge at the time, but they had a real receiver playing like the number two receiver position running routes out there. Um, but again, it's also like football is so much about technique and like, it's so much about get the right single step, whether you're blocking, whether you're running, whether you're running a route, it's it's not as easy to portray the intricacies of football like everybody gets if the quarterback drops back runs away from a guy throws the ball and a guy catches it 40 yards downfield that's awesome but like to make that look realistic actually takes a lot more than i think people are able to put into the movie and yeah any given sunday i think falls victim to the same thing although i will say this roughness <laughs> you know what <laughs> That, I enjoyed unnecessary roughness so much, but it was for the comedy, not for the football. Mm. Um, uh, I will tell you my favorite football movie, um, and if that's you replacements. The replacements. You son of a bitch! Yeah, it is. It's my favorite. <laughs> of course, it's the John Wick universe. It's um, I. I believe that he is John Wick uh, in that movie. I love that fucking movie. You don't like replacements? No, it's a good. It's a good movie. I just the, the football in replacements uh, is it's not a great. mess. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a mess. But it's a very enjoyable movie as far as, you know, kind of a, a sports comedy goes. But I also like sports comedy is its own thing that we can start talking about. And I don't think yeah. replacements really ranks on that list either. No. Like it, it's just one of those movies that just feels like that is a perfectly fine, enjoyable movie. And it's fine. I tell you, you know? the best football movie right away Jerry Maguire. There's almost no football in it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Look. <laughs> Look, I mean, you're you're not wrong. Yeah. Like as far as and, and the other thing about football that I think some movies get right and some don't is a lot of the drama takes place in the more cynical look at like what happens. And that's why I love mm-hmm. any given Sunday because like the politics and the behind the scenes shenanigans in football are arguably weirder and shittier than they are in any other sport. And so mm-hmm. if you embrace that fully, you can get something out of it. And I, so I think that applies to Jerry Maguire as well. Like the weird shucking and jiving that they're both doing just to try to get this guy a contract is very true to life. And I think that makes for better drama than just like, can we get these six inches in front of us on the field? As far as football movies go, I've got a real soft spot for the program, which is sort of a little remembered Mm -hmm. jazz con joint. We just from, talked about that the other day. I was literally out and about at a party and we talked about the fact that the program featured a scene where kids laid down to show their bravery. They laid down in traffic on like a lonely highway and cars buzzed by them. They, they laid down right on the center line. So if cars were just riding the line a little bit, they would smash these kids and kill them. And they laid there as a test of bravery. Kids actually went and did that. And when they did, People came into the theaters and took prints of the movies off the fucking <laughs> the projectors <laughs> yeah. and replaced them with a cut that didn't have the scene in it. Like it got it was serious business. Well, and, but yeah, the and, program was a great movie about football. It had a fucking Omar Epps in it, right? Omar Epps was a star running back. A young Holly Berry was tutoring Omar Epps. Uh, a young mm-hmm. Christy Swanson was a fellow um, college athlete that fell for the embattled quarterback. Um Joe Kane was the embattled quarterback. <laughs> Joe Kane is the best name ever. After hey, all, he's on that. He's on that Joe Kane. Well, I was gonna say, after all, Kane is able. 
which was their, <laughs> which was their tagline for his Heisman campaign that they were putting together. But again, that movie is great because it really focuses on the behind the scenes shenanigans. Like Joe Kane was getting all depressed because essentially the school had so much riding on him and was pushing him so hard for the Heisman that it sapped like all joy out of the game. Another yeah. guy, one of the defensive linemen had gotten on steroids and became an absolute beast and was like indispensable to the team, but also like started beating his girlfriend. And so it was like, well, maybe that's not such a great thing. Like we said, the star running back failing all his classes, ends up getting tutored, ends up sort of realizing like, hey, maybe I shouldn't have so much all, like all my chips in the football basket. Like leaning into the cynicism of the behind the scenes in football makes that movie enjoyable to me. And you know what's interesting? Uh, when you start learning about football uh, and the, uh, the, the, you know, the outskirts of football and this crazy shit that happens in the locker room, um, you get pretty well entertained and um, I'm not going to go deep into it, but I want you all out there to just look up the shit that Charles Haley did. Um, I don't know if I know, I don't know. The, I don't know if I know this. Reference. If I'm, I want to make sure I'm saying his name, it might be the wrong, maybe not. Um, hold on one second. We're going to figure this out. Make sure I'm saying correctly. I mean, there's just a vamp while you're looking that up. There are so many wild stories, you know, Back to Ray Lewis, there was the there was the Minnesota Viking sex boat. There are so many guys that like. I mean, wild shit happens when it comes to the NFL. Uh, going back to the favorite um, football movies, um, yeah, my favorite football movie. Um, I like North Dallas Forty. I've only seen it like twice. But I love that in there, Nick Nolte plays like, I think he's a wide receiver because at the end he makes like a catch. So I think he's a wide receiver or a tight end. Look at Nick and Nolte coming up over and over. Go ahead. Dude, Nick Nolte. I mean, I think it's worth doing this because he comes in as like, yeah, in that movie, he was a coach much later in his life in the 90s. But yeah, this is, a, I guess, early 80s movie, late 70s movie. And he's just like this. He's got to put shots in his ass to get out on the field. He's got to do glutes to calm down. He's got to do this to come up. And he's just bound, pinging back and forth between all these responsibilities of, of being this super football god. And in the end, he like just there's this weird honor in him sort of quitting in the end or him quitting on his own terms and not being their toy anymore and all this kind of shit. And not, not taking all this shit upon himself. Like there's this thing about like, you have the legacy of the Dallas Cowboys on your back. What the fuck, the Cowboys? You know what I mean? Like, I, I hope you're. I, you know, I, I, Bill has a uh, family that's been in professional sports. I hope they never felt like they had to have, you know, anybody's and in, carry anybody's insignia. Because, like, that's so ridiculous. How like they just grind you up and expect you the whole time that they're grinding you to dust. For you to be like, oh yeah, this is great, Cowboys for life, as they grind the bot the fucking air out of your body. It's just well, fuck that. The Cowboys are actually a great example of that because the '90s Cowboys were fucking insane. <laughs> um, Charles Haley is I, is the guy I was thinking of. He would pull out his dick and just like jerk off while there were meetings going on. Like he <laughs> he did crazy crazy shit. <laughs> He, it, you later find out that uh, he was bipolar and the guy needed medication. But in the 90s, you didn't do that shit. Like people didn't right. get medication. So he was just a, like needed help and nobody knew about it. And he was being grinded down by all the pressure because he was also one of the best, uh, uh, I want to say, offensive linemen. He's a pass rusher. But yeah, yeah. It's, his whole thing was like, he was very, defensive very indispensable line, yeah. and important. Man. He was like a defensive end, basically. And yeah. and uh, his pass rush was very important to what, what they, and when he played for the Niners, I think. I mean, he bounced yep. around. But like each time he was on a team, they were like, okay, this side will have a great rush. You know, they just yep. kind of counted on him to be that. So I guess that is like a lot of pressure. 
Um, but yeah, the whole point of it is football also has this weird scenes of all the pressure, like uh, in Last Boy Scout when Billy Blanks kills himself. You yeah. know what I'm saying? He like shoots him. Dude, running. That's a good point. I, I got to say, that's one of the best football scenes of all time because obviously it's over top and it's not real football. But like it's raining. Tony Scott's directing it in that crazy world that I described earlier where yeah. everything is dark and rain's coming in sideways like Forrest Gump and fucking hut, hut, hut. And he gets the ball, and a, 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 a shadowy figure tells him that he needs to get a, a bunch of touchdowns. Telling a running back that he's got to go get some touchdowns. You might as well tell him, you're fucked. You can't do that. Your position doesn't allow you to do that. Right. You know what I'm saying? He goes out there, and in a moment of peak, pulls out a gat from his jockstrap and shoots guys. Shoots them in the knees and the face and everything on his way to scoring a touchdown. Drops the ball, takes off his helmet, and says, hey, life a bitch. And shoots himself in the head. And that's the opening of our football detective mystery. Can I tell you something? I've had nightmares that go that way. Like (laughs) seeing that scene, like I've had nightmares of being on the field and playing and some dude just pulling out a gun. It's like, it's like to the football player, what going to watch a movie would be like in a post uh, Dark Knight Rises shooting era. Yeah. It's like once that's in your head, it gets hard to shake it a little bit. But yeah. Very impactful opening scene is my point. <laughs> oh, damn. Well, yeah. That is a good – I forgot about The Last Boy Scout. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> well, dude, it's so fo- so football movies, I think Any Given Sunday, as we round out the football portion, I think Any Given Sunday is up there. We got to mm-hmm. talk about Rudy because for some <sighs> reason, the thing that, that's weird about Rudy to me is I don't remember the football being done particularly well, and I don't know how in the fuck they got a movie out of this motherfucker not playing – all the way to the end. I don't the machinations, the screenwriting machinations, story drama machinations to do a whole movie and then have him do that in the end. I mean, I'm just talking about masterful stuff. No, I mean the filmmaking in Rudy is great. And you know, like every great sports movie, it's about something other than sports, right? It's about yeah. his determination, it's about him reconciling you know, himself with his family's view of him. It's mm-hmm. about him winning people to his side, you know, the right way. And, and you know, it's about the little guy, you know, getting what he deserves in a positive way in the end. I've just always hated Rudy because like Rudy is a movie that buys into kind of the cheap melodramatic mythology that we just spent like the past 20 minutes trying to tear down with all these other movies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And mm-hmm. like that, I, I I can't forgive Rudy for that because I think when you ask the question like to what end, I just don't like the answer because again, it's it's only there to service the glory of Notre Dame football or football as an institution and this idea that like yes, you should show up and grind yourself to absolute dust even when we treat you like shit because in the end, that's the way you achieve greatness. And it's like, I just don't know if that's a healthy way to be. It's not. And um, also, if you're really small, don't don't fucking play football. <laughs> Do it for Marty's torso. I'm not, even- <laughs> <laughs> not one of my favorite moments from Not Another Teen Movie where they're spoofing uh, uh, Varsity Blues. Yeah. Where they put the Rudy guy in and he literally gets torn in half by two defensive backs, like hitting him at cross angles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do well, and, store, so. and also that we're not a, gonna. Go that is a barely exaggerated version of what can happen if you're too small <laughs> playing football. <laughs> well, absolutely. I mean, at a certain point, gravity is the 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 most powerful of all the forces. But um, I, and we're not gonna be talking about probably slap shot, which is yeah. great, or like fucking people talk about Bull Durham a lot. It's not one yeah. of the things that really impacted me. Um, even like something like I think Feel the Dreams is big because obviously it's great. But it is also not just about baseball. It's about like the game bringing people together, low key. Like even when they 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 part the they I guess they part the other type of corn, and then the Negro League players come through or whatever. <laughs> you know, it's just like well, all, all all that shit about the love of the game and how it binds people and how like the game for the game, like without like fans and stands and everything, like the game itself is like sacred and beautiful, and it's kind of like that's kind of what the end of blue chips. Not to bring it back up again is about though, like the game is beautiful. What these guys are doing is beautiful, and it is we who have commodified it and fucked it up. You can't waggle your finger at athletes and go, "You're not a role model. You're not this. You're this. You're that." You fuck them up. 
Yep. You fucked mm-hmm. up their ability to be a human being by exalting them, number one. And you fucked up the game by commodifying them. So either way, it's you. It's you that has the problem, not them. I, I would agree with that assessment. I I love Field of Dreams. You know, I think there is a way to critique it for being too schmaltzy in the same way that I just did with Rudy. But I think for the reason that you're talking about, Ed, the fact that like it doesn't want to convince you that the game is going to bring you any kind of glory. It merely wants to acknowledge that like this is a part of our shared culture, our shared history. And within it, it brings people together because it in and of itself is a beautiful thing. Outs- and, I, you know, and that I think it's telling that in that story, it's the, the 1919 White Sox uh, or the Black Sox who, you know, they had the the cheating or what was it? The gambling scandal mm-hmm. uh, where they had their World Series title stripped. And that's the team that ends up coming back on the field of dreams, because, again, it is about like outside of that, outside of the shittiness that the modern world brings to the game, the game can still be beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there is also so, some, sorry, I, a couple of uh, really important things I do have to bring up, um, and that's ladybugs. Okay, we need a soccer movie in this, and um, <laughs> it's the only one I can think of. So, uh, ladybugs, bend it like Beckham, bend it like Beckham. Like Beckham. You know, again, I that's think bend not... it like Beckham's pretty good. What I've seen well, of it, so but I yeah, haven't seen the whole thing. So, well, like I said, we're, we're it's not like that's not really going to be in our purview, as you stated yeah, so yeah. eloquently earlier. We're going to quote unquote miss stuff. I would argue with the uh, term miss on a lot of this shit. <laughs> you, know <what> I mean? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because uh, I don't, you know, if I don't like the sport, I'm not gonna like even the tennis movie, right? The whole point of uh, tennis movie being the the uh, Serena story, what the fuck, whatever thing, yeah, yeah. the thing that King, uh, Richard. Home, King Richard. I read that as a screenplay, number one, because another one in my in my series of like, I already know the whole everything because I've read the screenplay months before off the blacklist. And I honestly was thought it was OK, but like how it got filmed and stuff, it had an extra layer. But even there, it was just like, yeah, this dude's whole life is his kid because he didn't get to do stuff. And it was like it was like taking the dad from like uh, Varsity Blues and making him the good guy in a movie. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And but but again, also like you know with fatherhood and especially as, as fatherhood is depicted in the hood, you know he was like really trying so hard to like not only do something that was unseen, like be a good dad, but also be a good dad in a direction no one had ever gone before. If he was trying to teach those those chicks how to play fucking basketball, nobody would have said shit. You know, that there, there's something I want to kind of start identifying the key key marks of what makes these movies great. And it's all about that underdog shit. It, that's amorphous. I think the finer point of it is there's a point of belief in each of in somebody in each of these movies that mm-hmm. is like unrealistic. You can't. You shan't. You don't have the skills. You don't have the will. That part is what makes them the underdog. That lack of some, but their own belief, other people believe in it. You know what I'm saying? Well, I was, I was even going to say that about Field of Dreams is it's that idea of finding transcendence in sport. There's like a mm-hmm. spiritual component of it. You mm-hmm, know what I mean? Mm-hmm, it's like, mm-hmm. it's like I am going to, you know, despite what anybody thinks, despite the laws of nature, I'm going to defy all that to achieve something that by all rights I shouldn't, right? It's, it is it is sort of a secular spirituality. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously it's, you know, it, it feels the dreams, it's very on the nose in that way. But I do think that that's kind of what you're talking about, Ed. It's that idea that like, if I, if I don't waver, if I keep believing, if I don't stop believing and just keep <laughs> working, like it's gonna, something magical will happen. Uh, yeah, because it's like one of these things where, uh, again, I think these movies butt up against fantasies, right? Mm. Because in a fantasy, you wander in the woods, you find a special sword. Maybe it's in a crocodile's mouth. You got to tell it three riddles, whatever the fuck. But the bottom line is sports movies have all that. But in this so-called realistic milieu, like Mr. Miyagi teaching you how to do this so that you learn how to block this, this like there's some sort of. Uh, in my minor league experiences in, in weight training, one of the dopest things about it is delayed gratification. 
-hmm. you don't know that the reps you're doing right now are going to result in muscles. You have no evidence of that, actually. But you got to do the reps anyway. Daniel San on the thing, fucking Major League. You talk about belief. Major League is one of Major my favorite League. movies of Fantastic. all time, period. And Fantastic. to me, it's movie. the best of those baseball movies because those motherfuckers had to that they had to believe in themselves. And they had to, and the whole bad news. I think it's better than the bad news bears. I said it. I think it took bad news bears technology and put the flux capacitor on that shit. Because you know, like uh, Willie Mays Hayes. He's fast. He's so fast. He could turn off the light and be in bed before the fucking, the, 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 you know, before it gets dark. But he can't catch. He can't throw. He can't do anything. <laughs> so they got to figure out a way to use this hyperspeed guy that has no other skills. So on and so forth. Corbin Burnson just playing out the string. They got to find some way to motivate Corbin Burnson's rich ass character who just playing out the string. This super hitter guy who believes in all this voodoo and shit. <laughs> got to keep his voodoo happy to make sure he can keep hitting. You know, there's all this stuff. And, and most of the other players are too old or too fat or too dumb. Ricky or Wild too... Thing Vaughn can't control Great. his fastball. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Throws. He could throw it through. He could throw it. Around, he could throw it and hit somebody in China. But he won't hit a specific person in China <laughs> because he doesn't have any control. It's like. I love all of that. And just the acquiescence of everybody, like learning, everybody learned to deal with their limitations in that movie. Nobody said, nobody was bad at stuff and then just got great at stuff. They were bad at everything they were bad at, but they found a way to be a team that used their special skills and mitigated their weaknesses. And that's the whole point of a team. That's the whole point of team sports, right? The different positions do different stuff. Different yeah. people could contribute in different ways. That's the point of it. I mentioned it before, but I got to mention it now because this is essentially the dramatic side of the major league coin, and that's Moneyball. Mm, Money, yes. Moneyball is a modern classic to me. It was written by Aaron Sorkin, and you know his pedigree speaks for itself. But that is a great sports movie because everything that you just said about major league applies, and that has the extra added benefit of being a true story. And that also is like what Brad Pitt is doing, right? The whole introduction of saber metrics to the management of sports teams. If you look at that in a big picture view, it is a very cynical thing. Like it's kind of gross and it is, it is sort of the height of sports as commodity and like the corporatization of sports. There's nothing romantic about using statistics to manage your ball club. However, that movie uses all the tricks that we've been talking about. Number one, Brad Pitt believes and everybody else doubts. And he has mm -hmm. to achieve transcendence by holding on to his belief and just making it work. Number two, you see that all the pieces he assembles are flawed and broken and can't mm -hmm. work on their own. But if you put them together in the exact right way, following the sabermetrics paradigm, they'll coalesce into something greater than the sum of its parts. And when all this works together, when you trust the process and delay that gratification, miraculous things happen. And like, it's such a weird way to look at sports because it really isn't about, you know, training and grudge matches and like leveling up your skills. It's really more about like, I, I, it's so tough because any way you say it, it sounds lame, but it's, it's like, bringing intelligence and strategy to the way you assemble your lineup and put your players out there. I don't know. It's, it's, it's kind of a miracle that that movie works as well as it does because it's taking something that's very sort of cold and calculated and turning it into a classic sports story. Yeah. So now I have a couple of questions for you um, that I think are very important. Uh, Karate Kid, does that count as a sports movie? Oh, yeah. Gleaming the Cube, does that count as a sports movie? No, Gleaming heard. the Cube does not count as a sports movie, but you do need to see that, Bill, because it features Tony Hawk driving a bunch of kids around, a young Tony Hawk driving a bunch of kids around. It, it features stunt doubles of Christian Slater doing some really cool stunts on skateboards on the highway, ducking oh. under semi-trucks and shit. It's, 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 it's a kid it on a skateboard solving a murder mystery. Like if Brick had balls. Wow. In the eighties, that's what it is. Wow. It's not Pretty as good dope. as Brick. I'm not trying to be an asshole, but like that's that's why I'd pitch it. If Brick had balls in the eighties and skates, okay, uh, or skateboard. Uh, okay, rollerball. Uh, rollerball kind of counts because it is. It's just like a future North Dallas forty about like James Con and all his homies 
they're in a brutal sport and they're being commodified and shitted on and they don't have the benefits they should have and yada 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 and their stardom is being weaponized against them and all this kind of shit so yeah it's dude by the, by that metric fucking running man's a sports movie mm. Ooh, interesting yeah, see that's what enough. i'm curious about is what movies kind of you know sneak into it like my favorite uh sports movie airborne uh the best uh air, and air only bud airborne the oh. only rollerblading movie uh that really <laughs> exists uh-huh, uh-huh. it's not a good movie at all I was gonna say, you're it's, probably better off watching air bud but yeah, yeah honestly i mean airborne's hey, fine it, it there's has nowhere some, in the has, rules use... that says a dog can't use rollerblades <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that'd be hilarious um i do enjoy airborne uh for what it is and there is some good skating in it and and there is a race in it so technically okay. <laughs> um okay no it's not a sports movie um but i'm just making some jokes about but i do think it's interesting like what what stuff can go into counting as sports movies you know what i mean like it, it, does it have to be a specific team thing or well, individual here's... I mean, here's a left field one that I think was great recently was Ford versus Ferrari. Ooh, mm. that you know, is a well, good think, movie. Yeah. Well, you know, I, the the thing I I just got to get this comment out and then we can roll on. But like, there's this interesting thing. I say Major League, you say Moneyball. Major League is from the players' perspective, and the mm. and the and the and the and the, he, and the villains are the management. And Moneyball management is basically the heroes and the other people are low key NPCs. Like, mm -hmm. honestly, but, you yeah. know, yeah. they're just being moved around and managed by these smarter people in management who are trying to, by the way, fight a revolution to make the other people in management smarter. Right. Like I'm a fucking genius and I'm surrounded by idiots who go, I like the cut of this guy's jib. You know what I'm saying? It's like, well, he hits, he hits 14. He hit I me. Mean, he hits 140. After the seventh inning, for some reason, he has no stamina. That, I just like how he chews his gum, man. It's, a, it's like, motherfucker, I am showing you with math that this dude sucks ass for what we're trying to do. And you don't listen to me because you're doing aphorisms. You know what I'm saying? You're fucking Buddy Epson over here. And I, I think that that's interesting because, like, there is this whole uh, game day. You know, there's all these movies now that are coming out that are about the management of sports. Mm -hmm. Like the yeah. managers and the owners are like heroes now. Mm. You never saw that shit before. You never saw that shit before. Have, have the motherfucker who signed Michael Jordan to a Nike contract got a movie now. Yeah, it's that's, a, that's weird. an interesting point, man. That is weird. Have you guys watched any of the Rock uh, football mo uh, show? Ballers? Yeah, Ballers. Have you guys seen Ballers at all? I have not. Now I've I'm seen curious. some of it. I've seen some of it. It is about the seedy underbelly, but it's also like all HBO shows about shit like that. It's like, oh, this world is so sordid. Oh yeah, I'll take fifteen blowjobs in a in a bathtub. Yeah, right. super cool. Okay. Oh man, this world, this world is tearing me down. Oh yeah, uh, Ferrari blowjob. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. You know, it's a, it's like so gloriously oh, okay. fucked up. It's like Entourage. Up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Oh, this world is so debasing. I think I'm gonna go retire to a farm. Oh yeah, two chicks. Bring them on in, you know. It's... Yeah, hard life, hard life. The rock lives. Um, <laughs> I think well, that's an uh, interesting point, Ed. That we're we're trending toward, and and again, maybe it, it fits this larger thesis of like the culture is kind of wrestling with the reality of sports. Where in the past, you did want to take it from the players' perspective because we sort of lionized the players in that gladiatorial way, like mm -hmm. yeah. These, these are great men doing great things. And as the culture sort of abandons that perspective, maybe our appetite for sports movies remains, but we do have to find different ways in. And yeah, I mean, everything from Moneyball to Game Day to Hustle, that Adam Sandler movie. Which to, I enjoyed. You know, whichever that, whatever that Ben Affleck movie was about how he's an alcoholic and he finds his way back. I think it's called The Way Back by coaching mm -hmm. a basketball team. Mm -hmm. It's like suddenly we do have this influx of, you know, coaching and managing and, and helping a team, being an agent, which is kind of a Jerry Maguire thing, too, is like mm -hmm. that's where you find your glory and helping people succeed, you know, outside of you succeeding. Maybe there's sort of like a very shallow element of, of thinking of that as like altruistic. 
Yeah, maybe. And, and knowing that we got to do more stories about some of these tertiary people, because obviously there's only so many movies like Michael Jordan will probably never license his likeness to anything again. There was like a Lifetime movie with some dude playing Michael Jordan. It's like, OK, bro, yeah, this is not acceptable. This does right. not look like Michael Jordan. He doesn't have the bearing. It's not his fault. He's not Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan's one of one. That was the whole point. I mean, you know, but I'd I'd rather uh, the whole bottom line about movies, though, uh, about the moving and shit. I got to bring up one from my childhood, which is above the rim. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but it was about like high school kids going in sort of a weird AAU slash school system of like ballers who were like samurai slicing each other up on the streets. And some people couldn't take a bad beat. So they'd whip out a gun and shoot you. And just all this bad shit of like trying to make it out of the hood and trying to make it good in the hood, as far as like being a basketball player and being respected in the street game, as well as in school, school, like mm-hmm. the dichotomy between the games of like, you got to have some super hot sauce on your outside. But when you go to, you know, Cracker State, <laughs> you better know how to do a proper bounce pass <laughs> shit. You know what I'm saying? You got to have all your fundamentals down and have a bunch of sauce for the street. That, you got to yeah, be I'm, like both. I uh, I have not seen Above the Rim, so I will uh, I will cop to that, but that sounds like a good movie. Yeah, that's, that's kind of it, what it's about. It's got all the shit. It's a solid-ass movie. Um, well, and, you know, since we're talking about basketball movies, we'll, we'll bring up a couple of really important basketball movies. Space Jam. Oh. Um, <laughs> Space Jam, one of the most prolific sports movies. Hey, look, Space Jam was a staple of my childhood, but that's yeah. one of those things from your childhood that, like, doesn't hold up when you revisit it. <laughs> I know, because, like, look. Lola Bunny's mid-range game was trash. <laughs> and I don't understand why everybody felt the need to double team her when in reality they could have played. I think off you know why game. they wanted to double team her. <laughs> oh <my God>. <laughs> <laughs> what are you, the internet? <laughs> stop, stop, right. stop rule am... 43 in this podcast, guy. <laughs> <laughs> the internet. The internet's uh, infiltrated wrong. <laughs> it's coming out of his pores, oh, bits and bites, oh, ones and zeros pouring out of your nostrils. I just, uh, <laughs> I just wrote the weirdest uh, uh, fantasy Space Jam uh, fanfic of all time, right there. <laughs> let me let me clue you in. It exists already. Oh, for it exists sure, yeah, for sure, a yeah. lot already. <laughs> it one hundred percent exists. Um, but, uh, but also, here's one that I really mm-hmm. did enjoy, and I think is. I mean, maybe I'm remembering it more fondly than I should because I watched it with my best uh, friend uh, and oldest friend, uh, Lance, like a bazillion times. And that's uh, White Men Can't Jump. Oh, that's a great movie. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. I mean, well, you're, number one, you're not remembering it wrong. Uh, you, can, you, you can hear the movie. I mean, you can listen to the movie and you can hear the movie. You can yeah. hear Jimmy. <laughs> I, the, the movie's, uh, I'm not going to filibuster on this too long. The movie is great because it shows that basketball has its own special like codes and sequences in it that a lot of different people of lot, a lot of different athletic abilities can learn. And there's a lot of muscle memory and, and strategy and angles to basketball. And I think it showed that like a lot of those guys that were playing on the streets couldn't play in the league, but that doesn't matter. They set up their own economy of basketball, right? And that that was the way for dudes who couldn't quite make it overseas, couldn't quite make it to Waxahachie State. You know, their grades weren't good enough. They couldn't get some pretty girl to fucking do all their homework for them. So they fucking flunked out or whatever led them to be on Venice Beach with all these skills. Once again, it's like what we were talking about earlier. Sports skill doesn't doesn't mean you're going to have life skill, motherfucker. Mm, Wesley Snipes was the illest basketball player in there, by the way. By the way, making Wesley Snipes look like a good basketball player. You need 87-11 stunt (laughs) team. To make that shit. He was a great athlete, no doubt. Oh, yeah. But he's an awful basketball player, and it you is might, very apparent. You might even say that he resembles Willie Mays Hayes in that respect. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Just athleticism for nothing. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> athleticism for nothing and your chicks for free. <laughs> but, the, but, yeah. The other thing I want to say about uh, White Man Can't Jump is it belongs to this sort of rare subcategory of sports movie, which is like – the back alley secret subculture sports movie. And yes. I would say The Hustler with Paul Newman is another yes. example of that. And Color of Money. Color of Money, right. Color of Money. Love those movies. Right. Uh, even you, you kind of get into poker movies when you're doing that. Something like Rounders. Rounders. Yeah. Rounders is great. 
Exactly. And so this is great. That's, you know, I think you, you almost have to be in kind of non-professional, you know, I, whatever you want to call it, sort of whatever the street ball version is of your sport in order to tell those stories, because it really is about the people that exist on the fringes and the way that they can make a living or, or find an alternate way to do it other than just chasing the glory of, you know, a big pro sports contract. Um, Bull Durham almost fits into that as well, which I know we yes. kind of glossed over. No, but yeah, Bull Durham being about the minor leagues, anything about the minor leagues or people on the edges of stuff, I'm into. Yeah. All right. So now that we've gotten to this point, I think we can do, uh, you know, ne- the next 20, maybe 25 minutes on the very important uh, comedy sports stuff. Comedy sports, sports comedies. I mean, the only one that we haven't hit that I think is worth mentioning in the greatest would be Happy Gilmore. Yeah. Happy Gilmore is amazing. Uh, excuse me. I think we have to mention another Sandler favorite, which is the water boy. Water boy. Oh, I saw, shit. dude, I share, I share managers with uh, a guy called Nate Hurd. Nate Hurd is a fantastic comedian. He's a very funny guy. He's a friend of me and Ron's. Um, yep. He basically just filmed his special. And I'm in the special. I'm I'm one of his entourage going into this special thing. Zane Helberg directed it. Anyway, the point is, he came in with this jersey, this like yellow and like blue or whatever jersey. And I was looking at, I was like, is that Florida? Because I know he likes the Florida Gators. Is that? It's the he was wearing Bobby water Boucher's boy. fucking water boy jersey, <laughs> and I was like. Go ahead with your bad self. That's <laughs> fucking amazing. He wore that on his special, the Bobby Boucher jersey. That's kind of amazing. <laughs> it's fucking great. <laughs> oh, I will say um, an oft quoted line in my household Bobby, it's me, Roboito, yo daddy. <laughs> <laughs> when he shows up at the end, Take the money, stupid. <laughs> Dude, he's like, uh, it's at the rope with your medulla oblongata. <laughs> dude, dude, the fact, like, again, Waterboy is like the extreme parody of sports movies, i.e., you notice how often we've, we've mentioned these, like, with the superhero ethos of, like, or superhero trappings of, like, Willie Mays, hey, super fast. This guy could jump super high but can't run a good route, so on and so forth. This is another one of those, man. It, mm. it just, there, there's some superhuman skills here that aren't being you know, marshaled. That's yeah. really funny, actually. I mean, I, I hadn't thought of it that way, but that does categorize those Adam Sandler movies. They're essentially like he is a super, he is superhuman. He just doesn't, he just doesn't know how to handle it. You know, mm-hmm. between happy Gilmore, the water boy, some might even say in something like uh Billy Madison. I, well, I don't know about that, but anyway, no. what's funny too, is Will Ferrell tried to go down that road to much less success I feel like Talladega Nights was good. And then there was just diminishing returns through Blades of Glory, um, Semi-Pro, the basketball mm-hmm. one. Mm-hmm. Um, I know there's one in there that I'm missing, but it's like. He had a k- kicking and screaming, but that was when he was mm. a soccer dad coach. Right. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, movies, sports movies do run into a weird hole of like how do you integrate stars into them? Cause a lot of them aren't about stars. Like maybe that's how we could round down the conversation is like, like how many of these movies have bona fide fucking movie stars in them? And how are they used? Cause I would say if that major league is about Tom Berenger, yeah. but if that movie had 80% Tom Berenger scenes, it would not be as good. It's about the team, but the main guy is a recognizable movie star that ain't too big, ain't too small. And, and, and Rene Russo, Come on, man. Rene Russo, I mean, man. Rene Russo in the 80s. I mean, oh, come on. It's like Jennifer yeah. Connelly in the 90s. Like, yes, oh, yes. Jesus. Yeah. You're, you're on to something there, though, because I do think in the ethos of the underdog, of the little guy trying to prove himself, blah, 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 like, you don't necessarily want to put Tom Cruise in that role, right? Like, Tom Cruise isn't going to be your minor league pitcher that's just looking for his, for his shot, man. Like I, you just kind of don't believe that, or even if, if you believe it, there's just something about it that feels a little off. It doesn't feel as authentic as like early career Adam Sandler trying to prove that he's a golf phenom, despite being, you know, uh, essentially an MTV personality. 
I so, mean, that's part of it, though. Like those type of movies, you kind of have to pick the next Tom Cruise. You know what yeah. I mean? Because like, like Color of Money, right? I don't think Color. I think Color of Money came out either right directly. It came out in like the wake of something like Top Gun or right before Top Gun. I probably got it all mixed up. But the bottom line is he before. wasn't a Joe superstar at that time. He was right. no. bankable new young actor. And Paul Newman was supposed to be the guy who settled everything down, made sure that everything ran on time. And in the midst of it, that the tumult happened. Like right after that, it was like, oh, people would start thinking of it as a Tom Cruise movie. But at that time, it was it was the perfect time for him to be somebody who should be a movie star, but wasn't quite super yet. And well, to bounce off of a great star, you know. While you're messing around, uh, I have a, a soft spot in my heart for Days of Thunder. Yeah. Which is another, or the, I mean, that fits that same description of Tom Cruise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that one was that, that was them being like, okay, we can do Top Gun again, but this <laughs> but time with cars. A race car driver. Mm. Right. We're we going to ground it, literally. Uh, yeah. I don't know. That one, that one was weird because like with certain sports, with the, the challenge of the sports movie, there's two challenges, right? Set up somebody as an underdog and make us believe that they can't do it. But, make us believe in them make us believe they can't do it but make us believe in them that's challenge number one challenge number two is explain the mechanics of whatever the fuck they're about to do and if you fuck up number two you got a boring ass movie even Moneyball's, like frankly Moneyball is about the most boring part of the most boring sport most boring major sport yeah and somehow they made it magical how they were directing and, and and like showing the different aspects of the, the numbers falling down and like that i i got into it you know it, it was like tapping into the comic book lore of this this guy's got these powers and you can stack his card with these it was like magic the gathering with real guys yeah you know there is something to be said though that baseball is the most cinematic sport um and i don't want to necessarily get into it here but uh patrick h willems who's one of the great youtube video essayists on film covers this and I think makes a very compelling argument that like the lack of a ticking clock, the way that time can be stretched or compressed, mm -hmm. the way that like it is more based on stillness with bursts of unexpected drama that makes baseball such like this great cinematic sport. It does. Yeah, well, let's look at something like the natural. I don't think you could do the football equivalent of when right. Robert Redford hits the ball and hits the fucking... I haven't even seen the whole movie, but I've seen that scene a thousand million times. Yep. And, you know, Homeboy is a big part of the story. He hits this ball and it hits the scoreboard and it just rains down like majesty on him as he's running around the bases. And it like knocks out all the other lights. So the only light is this splinters of light and sparks falling down. And it's fucking magical. They shoot it at like one billion frames per second as he's <laughs> running around the bases. It's fantastic. and It's magical. And it's because baseball has that mythic nature. Because uh, when you look at it realistically, like it's much <laughs> like boxing. If you look yeah. at it realistically, it's boring as fuck. But like, uh, uh, but when you put it on film, you can, like you said, stretch time, stretch the rules, you know, uh, stretch the way it's even played. And and last things last, baseball, unlike a lot of team sports, has a lot of periods of one person against one person. Correct. It has a lot of that. Yeah, you get you get the game in microcosm where it is just about what's this one guy doing, thinking, feeling, adjusting like you don't have to know what all the other guys are doing. You could just focus on that one guy. And that is what's important. Whereas like in football, if you want to just even if you want to just live with the quarterback and live in his mind and what he's seeing and whatever, like he's really just reacting to all these other people, right? It's not just yeah. about the man versus himself, which you do get in baseball. Yeah. Although I got to say, maybe that's why Waterboy is so great is because it's just Bobby Boucher seeing his mom or somebody else be mean to him. Yeah. I mean, the other, <laughs> yeah. Unex but unexpected, uh, maybe for me, who likes to really overanalyze things, you cannot underestimate the greatness of just tackling the shit out of somebody. Yeah. Like the, yeah. there's a reason that those Terry yeah. Tate office linebacker commercials were so legendary. Like mm -hmm. it is never not enjoyable to watch an unsuspecting person just get absolutely flattened. Yeah. It is pretty great. <laughs> it's 
pretty great. It, it is. It's I mean, there is someone falling down the stairs. Yeah, yeah. You know, nuts. It's yeah. yeah. It's all good. It's all. It's all hilarious. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. It's good times. Um, and like, I just want to mention um, uh, a movie that I saw when I was a kid. I don't know. I haven't seen it in a couple years, but it had Billy D. Williams and Richard Pryor. And it was called Bingo Long on the Traveling All Stars and shit. Whoa. It was this it's an interesting old ass movie about basically the barnstorming days of baseball, hmm. where the adventure to even get to the town to play the fucking game was part of it to getting paid after you play the game. Is part of the adventure. The chick that you met in the last town showing up with her husband and saying some stuff to you, and he's got a shotgun, you know, and all this type of shit, all these different things, the gambling that took place, like all those factors, because it's so disorganized. I just want to mention that as part of that underworld. Not, and it's not a sinister movie or anything, but it is about so called disorganized, organized sports, right on the fringes, barnstorming sports. I kind of like any sport sport movie where you get to spend some time with them on the team bus and shit all those like that's why i kind of like basketball movies like he got game it's a big one for me when i was yeah. a kid because like when i was a kid kobe had just come out <laughs> as they say mm-hmm. and uh fucking uh then the, ray allen was gonna be that next guy and then he's in a spike lee movie and then denzel's playing his fucking dad and and again but i think we've turned i think we are a cynical podcast I think we do like this. Well, I think two out of three ain't bad as far as that goes, because Ron is a beam of light. But I'm telling you, I I think we gravitate towards these because it just there is a majesty to sports, but there's all this commodification. And in that movie, there's a lot of like business dealings going on. He becomes Jesus Shuttlesworth is a Ray Allen's character in the movie. And basically Denzel's dad gets out of prison with the express mission of telling his kid to go to this big school so that he can get money from that big school, so that Denzel can get money from the big school. So he's going to steer his kid to go to the school. But he went to prison, more or less, for killing that kid's mom in an accident. So he's got to go to his kid, who he went to prison for killing, and say, hey, buddy, I know we haven't talked in a while. Got to chat to you about some stuff. By the way, go to Big State so I can get money. It's like a fucking classic fucked up conundrum of a movie. And also, yeah, Ray Allen, a.k.a. Jesus Shuttleworth's girlfriend, is like fucking dudes to get him business opportunities and go on like why why would you not want me to fuck that guy we're gonna be rich you know like there's all this shit that starts happening to him because of the economy of how rich he's gonna be how everybody starts to like they see that he's going to be an economy so they they quickly take roles in that economy unbeknownst to him he's just being himself yeah. And thinking he's regular, but all his 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 girlfriend turns into a weirdo, and his fucking his mom is colluding with managers, and this not his mom, but you know his his, his the people that he cares for, like uh, he also has to take care of his little sister, so he's really money motivated. He's like really tempted to do a lot of the bad stuff, and they're like throwing like hookers at him on his school visits and shit. I mean, oh, it's there's a lot that goes on, and it's just about like one guy trying to navigate being a basketball store but it's about all that other shit that i said yeah and it's just that's what makes it such a powerful movie it is flawed mila jovovich is in there for like 35 minutes for no reason <laughs> <laughs> so it's got its flaws but it's a good it's a good sports movie i wanted to mention it yeah and i want to bring up a couple ones um i think a league of their own is one we should probably bring up that's uh, a great movie it that's really a great just- movie yeah, it's just a great movie, period. I, and I feel like this is another one of those where the baseball is important to the movie, obviously, but it's the story around it all that is is so great. That one also fits into that sort of underground barnstorming mode that Ed was talking about, where it's mm-hmm. like, you know, it's not about something that's glorious and huge and you know star studded it's about you know they're just struggling to survive and they don't even know if people want to watch them and like that aspect really makes that movie enjoyable that sort of the lovable losers or like the whole cast of misfits or whatever you want to call it like that uh, that's great in that movie yeah 100 percent. yeah yeah um, i love every character in that movie honestly and i think every yeah. performance is what it's supposed to be which is so hard with these 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 um movies with larger casts uh marla hooch mvp of that movie for my oh yeah always fucking yes. love marla hooch 100 oh, man yes 100 agree um i mean gina davis tom hanks you uh, rosie o'donnell <laughs> 
<laughs> hey, Lori Petty as the little yeah. si- as, as Gina Davis's yeah. little sister fucking kills it in that movie. Yeah, that movie yeah. is fucking great. That movie. Well, is I mean, great. it just I like the fact that they're personal battles and like somebody has to leave home to get the glory that they need, you know, to get out from under their sister's shadow and stuff. Uh, along those lines, Warrior, not to get off oh. Uh, oh. too much, but like something like Warrior, I think Warrior, League of Their Own, they're both very good movies about the siblings playing a sport or doing a doing a physical activity and fighting to be the greatest and you know always be in your shadow always be in your shadow i didn't know i had a shadow fuck you you did too know you got you had a shadow you know all that shit i love it i i can never recommend warrior enough that was a movie that i ugly cried to as an adult and i do think yeah. it hits you harder if you do have like close sibling relationships but that movie just plays every note of a great sports movie up to and including at the end like life is about more than what we do in the ring and it doesn't mm-hmm. matter as much as what goes on outside the ring. Um, unbelievable movie and continues the Nick Nolte trend. In, in that one, Nick Nolte's the alcoholic <laughs> dad in Warrior. Holy shit, yeah. <laughs> Which I love. I so, love and there's a couple other ones that I want to, uh, I, I kind of want to hit on. One that I haven't seen, but I'm curious if you guys have seen and I feel like ashamed that I haven't seen this because it is, a, a supposed to be a comedy classic and that's candy shack oh uh yeah i've, I've seen it probably a hundred times <laughs> does well, it count it as a sports movie or is it just straight comedy is wild i don't it know is, it is it is a comedy set in a sporting world i suppose okay but it's really more of like a it's like a slobs versus knobs or uh, whatever, however, whatever you call that. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't I'm not even exactly 100 percent sure what you're referring to. And that's hilarious. <laughs> you'll, you'll get it once I explain it. So, <laughs> um, no, it's it's that it's that National Lampoon thing where it's like the uh, almost like Revenge of the Nerds, right, where it's like your misfits and your, you know, never be part of the popular click group of group of main characters are going up against the rich snobby institution. Um, okay. Animal house, I, essentially. Caddyshack yeah. is essentially animal house at a country club. I already love it. Yeah. If you're mean to rich people, I'm in. Well, then you it, should watch Caddyshack. Make, can they make a sport where they're, they're, we're just mean to rich people. I'll, I'll go pro with that. <laughs> That's funny as hell. Dude, you got like, that's what, you know what? I want to see, I want to see, I wish that American Gladiators hadn't failed again. Like American Gladiators (laughs) was a big part of my childhood, dude. Cause I was like, those were, you know what it was like? It was like, if you let a bunch of kids design sports Mm. and then let them draw what they would like to look like playing the sports, Mm. you would get American Gladiators. You yeah. know what I'm saying? As this, this weird new type of athletic stuff. I remember Gemini and Zap and all these fucking foolish Nitro. names. Like Nitro. All these guys uh, and gals who were just like these pinnacles of human perfection. They were like live comic books playing. And it, you, you, what you made me think of, Pros versus Joes, mm-hmm. is what, what you think made me think of is in regards to like uh, they had a show, Pros versus Joes, where basically regular Joes could challenge a pro to something athletic. And yeah. get totally shit housed, or occasionally win, but you know. <laughs> speaking, of, <laughs> speaking of pros versus Joes, dodgeball. Ooh, <laughs> I love that movie. I actually I do love too. that movie. Hey, if you can, if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. <laughs> <laughs> um, ben Ben Stiller turns in one of the all time great over the top villain performances in that movie. Just fantastic. Well, before, but really quick, before we get too far from it, Rodney Dangerfield got obsessed with sports for at least two or three movies in oh. the eighties and nineties. Like he had, I think that ladybugs thing or whatever, Yep. but, and then he had the Caddyshack where he beats motherfuckers in golf. He even had a movie where he had to like lose weight to get money or whatever. That's arguably athletic. And then back to school. Yes, sir. He yes. had to cash in his eligibility and jump up on there and do the triple Lindy to win the meat. And, and which is, <laughs> Jesus Christ, like him realizing that him doing physical stuff is the funniest shit in the world is part of why that guy's a comedic genius. Yeah. 
No, honestly, yeah. that goes back to the uh, water boy comment I made. Like sometimes just the straight up pratfalls of sports can make for the best comedy. Yeah. hundred percent agree. Um, so another couple of movies I wanted to bring up uh, was Million Dollar Baby. Uh, oh, let's let's talk about that real quick. My, my treatise on that is very quick. Okay. That movie would be like Rocky if the bitch lived. <laughs> but they decided to make it some fucking sad bullshit, and I don't understand why. Well, I'm yeah. sorry. I'm, I'm going to be brusque with this. Bitches need heroes, too. What the fuck are you doing? She's not... I, she could have just won. They got to break her back and the kill the nah, that's, that's that not based on a, Wasn't that based on a true story? I don't care. And this where she lives. <laughs> she wins. <laughs> Flip it. Change it a little bit. Something. I don't. I, I don't. Number one, I don't know that that was based on a true story. And I'm just saying there's so many women boxers that beat up chicks and win. Pick one of them. And, and they all got flash dance stories of being poor and welding during the daytime and boxing at night or whatever the fuck. Yeah. Pick one of those uplifting stories for Christ. They spent so much time making me believe in and love that girl. And then they fucked her up like that. I I felt it was one of my few times I felt like the middle aged lady in the movie where I'm just like, no, I don't accept the, the, their art. I just uh, don't. I, it personally offends me. There's there's things that like that. Do you remember City of Angels? Uh, yeah. I had never been more furious at the end of a movie in my whole <laughs> fucking life. What? Because it has heaven in it or something? Or what? What? what no, he dies Spoiler, at the movie. end. Um, she she dies like at the movie, end yeah. when she oh she so happy that she met the love of her life and gets hit by a fucking car. Are you fucking <laughs> kidding me? It is. It is Fuck kind of yourself. With the end of that fucking movie. <laughs> it is I don't like it. It's also a little bit like, they kind of fridge her in that movie. Because the whole movie they is do. really, it's about Nicolas Cage. And he's he's literally a biblical angel. And he's wrestling with whether or not he should give up immortality to become human. So he could be with this woman. And it's all about him trying to make that choice. And what goes into making that choice. And then he decides to be with her. And she fucking dies. And so it's like the whole point was just it's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. But like they really make you love Meg Ryan. And then she gets fucking hit by a car. It's terrible. Dude, and you know my ass will While be at God's this. office. Right. Yeah. Like with, with arms wide open. I, was I got so hit by mad. a truck. I don't I literally oh, don't know shit, if I've ever boys. been more mad at a movie besides <laughs> Blue Velvet. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that. Yeah. Oh my god! No, I'm t I'm sorry, dude, but I I really don't like that movie because of the ending. I really yeah, feel like all I the agree. boxing parts were good. The buildup was good. The like, oh, yeah, her cut man was great. All that shit. All the mechanics of the, the Rocky story, but with a girl. I thought that was great, but no, they got a Cormac McCarthy my shit all up, and I just I just didn't like it. I didn't like that. But it is a great it is a great film. It's best thing I think Paul Haggis ever wrote. Now that we can look at it in stark contrast, I mean, it's that, I guess, the first uh, Jaden Craig Bond movie, and then like Crash. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah, I don't. Uh, crash, Crash really shouldn't <laughs> be in that conversation. I'm just saying. I'm not saying if we're looking at best thing he ever wrote, it might uh, be this. You yeah. know, it might. You know, it yeah. might be Million Dollar Baby. So I have one that maybe stretches the definition of sports movie, but also I think fits. And that is The Wrestler with Mickey Rourke, the Darren oh. Aronofsky movie. Okay, well, let's talk about this because uh, what, there was a movie we talked about off air uh, that uh, my boy Rich Slayton was, uh, was, was looking up recently, which was called Cutting Edge, Ron. And yeah, in that one, it was uh, a bunch of shit. But a, a, a thing about... Fuck. Now you got me messed up. I'm sorry. I fucked up. Okay. My bad. My bad. It's it's catching. Bill, set that up again. I have another anecdote. Go. Okay. Did it again. My bad. Well, speaking of speaking of dark movies like Million Dollar Baby, um, this one maybe kind of stretches the definition of a sports movie, but I think fits almost all the tropes we've been talking about. And that is The Wrestler, uh, the Darren Aronofsky film with Mickey Rourke. Yeah, I was... Uh, uh, we were talking about movies that just made us physically angry. The wrestler <laughs> made my buddy, rich, rich Slayton, that both me and uh, Ron know made him physically angry. 
Like he was very mad at the wrestler, mad at the ambiguity of the ending, mad at mad at the relentless drudgery of the wrestler guy's life. I found it fucking delightful. Just the, you're in a trailer park playing with a little kid on an old Nintendo system and you're playing with yourself because at one time you were so big you were in a Nintendo game, but now you're late for work cutting meat at the fucking Safeway. Yeah. Get out of here, dude. That's the type of tragedy I'm talking about. That's real life tragedy. That's not breaking your neck on a stool. That's fucking real life tragedy. It's also one of those great movies that takes place on the fringes. It's it is yes. like, you know, the the barnstorming, you know, old timey leagues or white men can't jump or color of money. It's like we're not talking about your name, you know, you're not your name's not up in lights and you're not getting all the glory and the cheers. It's like you're just trying to carve out a living for yourself using your athleticism and what happens when that fails. I mm-hmm. think that that makes it a really interesting story. Absolutely. Um, uh, the wrestler, I felt, I think I, I gotta say that I think I probably felt a little bit like Slayton. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, I, you know me, I look, I love, I love some realistic, you know, drama and, and all of that stuff, but sometimes it's hard to be reminded like that you could be successful and then be nothing. Mm. It, it's hard to be reminded that and so i don't know when you watch something like that you go oh is that gonna be me can i even get to the successful part um well, it, it, <laughs> but i mean it goes it goes back to that early part of our conversation here where it's like there is no finish line and yeah, you know that guy true. reached the pinnacle of of what it is he was doing but then like you still got the rest of your life after that and what is that what does that look like? And I think that that's a very real question. And again, I think that's a very healthy indictment of the sports mindset. Like it isn't just about getting to the finish line where you've got the belt or the trophy or the world title or whatever, because you do still have a life to live after that. Yeah. And you know, an appropriate thing I think to end on in regards to the sports movies, like I said, this is ours. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the greatest talk about sports movies, the greatest, whatever sports movies in the aggregates. Uh, But I just think there's something special about the movies where it acknowledges that it isn't all the end all be all. But there's something else about how can I phrase it? Uh, The movies that are about the people who get too obsessed with sports, like not even just the players and them gone to seed or them falling out into the minor leagues or trying to get back and how sad that is or stuff stuff like the fighter where people kind of count you out because of an injury or something or your, 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 the problems that you have in your life or you're retired or whatever. Mm-hmm. That's one thing. But like the movies that are about how obsessed people are with sports, like the fan, the fan. or, you know, and shit like that. Or there's another one called big fan. And I think mm. it's an interesting movie. And I think, I think, uh, Pat Aronofsky Oswald. doesn't. Di- yeah. Pat Oswalt's in it. I don't think Aronofsky, di- Aronofsky does not direct it, but I think the guy who wrote the wrestler directs it. I think that's true. And bottom line, it's just about Patton Oswalt who has this relationship with this superstar player and he goes up and tries to meet him and basically shit goes bad and he gets assaulted. And then it gets reported that this guy assaulted him and it fucks up that player's life. So now he hates himself for fucking up the player's life by having the temerity to come up to him in a public place. Mm. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Mm. And he also has the city thinking he's some kind of asshole who tried to set up him. He's like, no, I love him. So it's like, it's like like the it's like the worst thing that can happen to a sports fan besides maybe that guy remember the cubs game steve He's bartman a, i was steve just bartman gonna bring that up <laughs> tries to reach out and catch the ball and fucks up the world series and everybody hates him he has to be escorted through the bottom uh uh tunnels under the stadium to get away from the mobs who are gonna kill him dude uh i had not let i had not yet moved to la i think i was in college when that happened and i'm from chicago and i'm a cubs fan uh, the hate was real, dude. Like, I, I think they may have made a documentary about that guy. Yeah, yeah. Because, like, he, I mean, he was straight up ostracized from the city of Chicago. Like, he could yeah. not show his face. It was crazy. I believe he moved. Yeah, I, and, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, to and nowhere. <laughs> Fucking I him and the Guardians of the Galaxy. The FBI. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> He's, his name is now uh, Titty, Tits McGee. <laughs> uh, I believe Hootie McBoob it is. Yeah, yeah. Hootie <laughs> McBoob. 
McLovin. Uh, He's McLovin. Is that a sports movie? Anyways. <laughs> um, yeah, but all, all these guys that are obsessed with, with sports, though, yeah, there there are there is this CD underbelly of that. Like the movies about people who bet on sports. Like fucking I, a sports movie to me is Bad Lieutenant. I'll tell you why, because throughout the ending part of Bad Lieutenant, I'm not going to even say what happens, but basically he's betting on the World Series. And as World Series, anybody who's a sports fan or anybody who has a fucking almanac, you don't got to be Biff Tannen to look this shit up. The, the, we know who wins, but the whole time he's betting the wrong side. And we're just watching him bet his house, his life to mafia guys like he's a cop Oof. and mm. these guys will blow up his house if yeah. he does not give them the money. And he's just betting wrong the whole time, and it's getting worse and worse. And he keeps like betting on Daryl Strawberry, and, and then he says some really mean racial things about Daryl Strawberry. And I, I you, anybody, a lot of sports fans have been there, you know. What I'm saying? As soon as yeah. that motherfucker missed a layup, he becomes all types of bad things that he wasn't <laughs> before, right? And so there's there's just something serious about somebody that has such a parasocial relationship with. At that time, I think it was the Mets. I think it was the the Met the Dodgers were playing the Mets or some shit like that. He had a parasocial relationship with like the Dodgers, and he just really thought that he could will his life to go right along with the Dodgers' lives and make money. And it's just like uh, the gambling movies are sports movies, is what I'm saying. I was just gonna say. I mean, here's a here's a movie about not necessarily a parasocial relationship with a with an athlete, but kind of a quasi social relationship with an athlete. That's also a gambling movie uncut gems Ooh. yes i mean yes that's, that's, that's a, a sports, sports movie. movie yeah it that's is. a sports movie dude he bet his whole life on whether kevin garnett would get the tap and whether kevin garnett would score 10 points by the the 10 minute mark of the second quarter and all this shit's like why would you bet your life on that that's crazy but he was in a headspace where he would he had a magical bond with kevin garnett he could feel Kevin Garnett. And he knew that Kevin Garnett could feel the power of the stones. And yeah, that movie, I'm telling you, I liked it. I ain't never watched that shit again. I felt oh, so was, jittery. I, yeah. I felt you know? like that with Jerry Rice sometimes when I was a kid. <laughs> you were just on a mind meld and like, I, mean, I just... would feel like <laughs> I needed him to make a catch at a time and he would make that catch. You know what I mean? I'd yeah. be like, just throw it to Jerry, just throw it to Jerry. And then he'd throw it to fucking Jerry Rice and he'd fucking <laughs> score a touchdown or he'd get the first down or whatever. I never bet on anything because I didn't have money, uh, which was great because I wouldn't have any money. Uh, <laughs> so because I would have sure for sure lost at some point. Although I guess in the '90s it worked out really well for the Niners, so maybe I would have been fine. I was just say Jerry Rice is the goat for a reason. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, but I I, I just want to say um, let's let's hit our let's try to hit top three movies for us. Okay. Yep. Uh, I'm gonna put. So being a film nerd, it's very hard for me to not put the original Rocky in yeah. the top three. Mm -hmm. um, probably even over Rocky three, even though I might like Rocky three better just as a holistic viewing experience. But that original Rocky is damn close to a perfect movie. Just just everything about it is so good. I could watch it a million times. Awesome. All right. But, uh, Ronnie? Ronnie? Uh, I am gonna. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna do it. I'm going with Waterboy. <laughs> Waterboy in the top three. Look at Ron. I, I have to do it. If I really think about movies that I've watched over and over again that are sports movie, Waterboy is in the fucking top three. It is for sure. Yeah, That's and have Gilmore too. Actually, you know, mm, that's real tough. Yeah, it that's is real tough. tough. It is I tough because. The Water Boy arguably has like bigger hit, bigger hitting, pun intended, comedy, but like Happy Gilmore, Shooter McGavin. I mean, come on. It, oh it, my God. It yeah. Matter. Yeah. Oh, I got to bring up one for just uh, uh, one for the old men. Just please, somebody with a new eye, go watch Vision Quest, see if it holds up. My recollections of watching it on VHS when I was like a little baby kid was like it was this amazing triumph of the will starring Matthew Modine. He went up against this wrestler named Shoots and he had to lose a bunch of weight to make weight, which was a weird comp thing for me as a kid. I was like, wait, he's got to get skinnier to beat mm. up the bad guy. That mm. doesn't even make any sense. I was mm. like, what the fuck? That doesn't make any sense. And I'm looking at this kid really just he's a gangly bum. He's not a great 
or of any stripe, and he's going to take down like the the champion wrestler in high school. I don't know, man. There, there's something uh, individual about wrestling movies. Those, those ones about a uh, fox catcher. Got to give honorable mention to fox oh, catcher yeah, being about the weird culture around wrestling. Because like the thing is, uh, with Olympic sports, the motherfuckers don't make no money. If yeah. you ain't the one, if you ain't the one on the Wheaties box, you ain't shit. You don't make money. You, your, your your pleasure is to spend your own money, getting good enough to hopefully make the American team if they pick you. That's your lot in life as an Olympic athlete, mostly. And so that guy, the foxcatcher guy, that weirdo, he's a rich guy who got so interested in, in wrestling so he could have parasocial, psychosexual relationships <laughs> with multiple fit men and wrestlers. Boom. You got Speaking you got yourself a cult, baby. Sexual, I Tanya. Okay, um, <laughs> that's a great movie, by the way. Yeah, it really it's is actually movie. a great movie. And figure skating is a sport. I'm, I'm not. I'm not so far gone in my uh, oldness or maleness that I, I don't think figure figure skating is hard as fuck. It is hard as fuck. Um. Okay. So uh, you you're going with Rocky? Oh Blonde. yeah. Uh, but and, wait, I, I did do a major league. Boom, and I already said everything I had to say about it. So major league yeah. is my selection. For, major league is a good call. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, there's there's so many to 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 include. It. I keep coming back, kind of despite myself. I keep coming back to Varsity Blues, and that's <laughs> one of those. That's one of those movies. Like that movie came out when I was a senior in high school and was the yeah. starting quarterback on the football team. Yeah. Um, that's, or yeah. I might I might have been a junior and I was the backup. I, whatever it was, like it hit me at the exact right time. It does have actually some very true to life football in it. Like the football is pretty well done in that movie. And like, yeah, it's a cheap CW CW level melodrama, but man, like it just hits all the right notes. I, Mm -hmm. I would not put it on the list of greatest movies for any other reason than it's my list. And that is a sports movie that I defines a huge part of my life. So uh, my top two Rocky and Varsity Blues. Uh, which one of you guys has a has a second movie to throw in the ring for your top three? Mm, second's kind of rough for me. I, I want to just instantly go White Man Can't Jump. I just want to. Yeah. I just want to do that. But part of me, and this is this is classic Ed Greer shit. I think I might have to do Hoop Dreams because it's not a movie it's a documentary and that's mm. just me wiggling mm. but I, and i'm just not going to do a giant thing about it i'm just going to say it was the sports movie besides perhaps blue chips that i watched that was like oh you might not never be shit mm. you might you might dedicate your entirety of your life every decision you make from now until college age on becoming a superstar player and it doesn't work out for in either of you really you know, you just don't get what you wanted out of it. And if you really had your druthers, you'd probably spend a lot more time hitting the books than hitting the, hitting the streets if you knew that your ankles were going to be silly putty by the time you're 21. You know what I'm saying? You might have thought about that. It was it just put it in such stark relief. I have to give it credence here. I have that, to. That movie is in the running for one of the for the greatest sports movie ever made. And yeah, yeah it, it is a documentary. And that I think that gives it extra points because it makes – all those things that we were talking about at the top of this conversation about like how sports can kind of delude you and make you lose your way. It puts that in stark relief when you're following real people who are going down that path. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. Hoop dreams is pretty, pretty amazing. Um, mine is more in the, um, you know, a thing like yours, Bill, where it's my favorite movie. Sure. And it's not, I don't even know if it's a good movie. And I mentioned it earlier. It's replacements. I, hey, I fucking love that movie. Fair enough. Fair I enough. Mean, again, I'm not even sure it's like, I, I'm not even sure if I watched it again, if I would be like, oh, that's a good movie. But I remember watching that movie and being like, I feel this movie. So look, you and I can mm. both have, you know, substandard football movies on our list. It's totally fine. <laughs> I'm waiting for Ed to throw one on his list. <laughs> oh, only cinema. Only cinema. <laughs> Well, to that uh, end, I, I was thinking for my third one, with respect to Caddyshack, which is one of my favorite all-time comedies, but I just have a hard time fully embracing it as a sports movie. I might have to go my third one, Uncut Gems. I think that mm. movie is fantastic. I could watch it again, even though you do feel like you're having a heart attack while watching it because the tension is just so high. I just think that's 
it is cinema. It is just masterful filmmaking, unbelievable performances. And it does fit. It's a good representation of that new modern way of looking at the sports movie, which is from the non-athlete point of view, you know, whether Mm -hmm. it's, whether it's the manager, whether it's the scout, whether it's the owner, whatever, I think looking at it from the degenerate gambler point of view is just as valid as anything else. And that movie is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and I, I don't want to have a paucity of girls on our list. There's not any women's movies besides maybe major league. I'll give that to one of you guys. Cause that has to be not major league. I mean, a uh, league, of their, league own. of their own that has to be somewhere in there, but girl fight too. girl fight launched hmm. Michelle Rodriguez. It was a lady boxing movie. I think it's what I wanted out of, um, uh, Million the blind baby. side baby yeah the blind side baby <laughs> oh also oh. i didn't mention the blind side because look man i'm not no. trying to get into this the controversies about it i just will say stop it with that bullshit like i you you could have adopted an emaciated black child you didn't have to adopt a wall you know what you were doing you know I mean, you preparing him to go to texas Everything about whatever. <laughs> everything about that movie is wild. I mean, like right, right down to the fact that like I, the movie works so hard to lionize that white lady, where it's like it's almost to the point where like this dude doesn't even do any work to become a great football player. Like it's mm-hmm. all just the fucking white lady. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. it's crazy how they turn the dude into a prop in his own story. Yeah, and, I mean they they uh you could say they jangled him anyway. Uh, well, and uh and the football just sucks in that movie. Oh, it does else. too. It yeah, it's yuck. So yes. yeah, that's why it doesn't make Wildcats is better than that shit. Yeah, as, as far as depicting a football, as far as ever, well, it's and that one's just an honorable mention. Uh, uh, Goldie Hawn coaches uh Woody Harrelson, I think, and Wesley yeah. Snipes as teenagers in a football underdog story it's great go it check it out good. it's a very good movie it is a very good movie um All right, so what's it what's everybody's third did you get a third um ronnie I, I went with uncut gems who's next um i will go with uh what i think is uh you know another one of those picks is just my kind of picks and uh that's blood sport um this is <laughs> a sports movie uh he does win the kumite and <laughs> I just want to point out that that's a sports movie. Um, no, I'm kidding. It's Rocky Three. It's Rocky Three. Oh, uh, wow! I thought you were serious. Like I would believe no. Bloodsport is your no. number three. No, no. no. I, I, I do think it's funny that that could count as a sports movie. He also did another movie called uh, The Quest, mm. uh, where his Muay Thai has to win out against multiple different styles of martial arts. It's like a kumite, but. Uh, slightly different because it's from different like cultures coming and bringing their style of martial arts. It's actually a okay movie for what it was. There's some good fight scenes in it, uh, but no, no, no. Rocky three, excellent choice. Rocky three. Yeah. Um. All right. For my yeah. Uh. I. I thank you, Ron, because you took the the onus off of me for picking Rocky three because that was about to go down. Uh. So you know what? Just I. I just picking this out of my life. We talked about it briefly uh, earlier. I'd like to take a chance to talk a little bit about it right now. The Color of Money is amazing, dude. Oh. If you haven't seen it in a while, just really go back and look at it. It's perfect young Tom Cruise, as I stated, more of a blank slate. And uh, uh, Eddie Felsen, played by uh, Paul Newman, says, you know what you got, kid? You're a natural flake. And there's something about it, dude, that's like, like you're naturally flighty and fucked up. So nobody knows what you're doing. If mm. I can get inside get inside your mind and give you some some basic principles of sports betting or betting on your own talent, showing up and being sort of a hey everybody, I'm here to play some pool. I'm a dumb idiot. That persona, put you don't. Other people would have to craft that persona. You got it naturally, kid. Just be you with my system in place in your mind, and you'll be a great pool hustler. Because he was great at playing. If he just played straight, he would beat everybody. But beating everybody isn't the game. 
And there was something magical. It had the barnstorming aspect of them traveling to play the CD places. It had a beautiful thing of him being an over the hill athlete because a lot of the places that he was taking Tom Cruise to work out his pool game were fucking closed or were furniture stores or dog food canneries because he's fucking old and he doesn't know anything anymore. So he's challenging himself to see if he still knows enough to be teaching anybody anything. And Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio is the finest woman put on celluloid. In that movie, she's so yeah. fucking fine. It's stupid. She burns yeah. a hole in the fucking screen, and like Paul Newman and fucking uh, Tom Cruise as this old guy, old lion, young lion thing. And last things last, the teaching of somebody that winning isn't everything, and not on that pussy shit. Winning isn't everything. Be a fucking loser. No, 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 no. Sometimes you gotta lose a little bit and make mm -hmm. them underestimate you so you can win big. If you think that didn't fucking get in my brain <laughs> there are so many motherfuckers that are underestimating each one of us on this goddamn stream right now and they're gonna get it they're gonna get it they're we're hustling them i that's how i gotta feel about it i feel that hustle gene in my bones about like you don't gotta win every match get them to think of you a certain way and then fucking wallop their bitch ass with all of your skills Ooh, i get goosebumps thinking about it man <laughs> amazing I mean, Amazing. that is a perfect way to end this podcast. It's perfect. The Color of Money is amazing. Uh, thank you guys for listening to our uh, but amazing uh, sports movie rants. And uh, I almost wanted to extend this to, to something along the lines of sports movies we hate because that mm. would have just been so comically good at some point. But maybe we'll do that for a Patreon or something like that. We'll complain about some real terrible sports movies or something. Um Speaking of Patreon, you can join our Patreon, patreon.com slash the greatest pod. You get extra podcasts and you get art sent to your house. Uh, and so check that out. Uh, also, if, if you don't if you don't have a couple of shekels to throw our ways, uh, wh why don't you do the most important, possibly most important thing you could do and leave us a five star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcast. If, if you if you don't if you do it in a weird spot, send us a picture at email the greatest pod we'll read it on air we thank you guys for supporting us we really appreciate it also if you're watching this on youtube click that subscribe button mash the bell do all the stuff you know i hate when you say mash the bell you know i, hate I know it. that's why i did it like, like, my body we're leaving shuts this in down. too we're leaving my it body, in my body mash shuts down bell. it's like it's like lead in my bloodstream. Oh, okay, okay. I apologize. You know what? I'll fix it up a little. Hold on, hold on. We'll fix it up a little. Tap the bell. Tap it. Just Jesus tap it. Christ. You don't All need right, to right. mash it. Um. Oh, yes. Make a sport out of leaving us a review. Do it all the places you can. You could leave a review on Spotify. You could leave a review on Google Play, I think. You could leave a review on Apple Pods. You could leave a review all sorts of weird places. And as Rod said, take a picture of it. Also, send us an email at email the greatest pod at gmail.com that's the entirety of the of the email address email the greatest pod at gmail.com we've gotten so many cool letters there we like to read them on air and uh, it is a significant part of being able to do intellectual congress with us in regards to sending us letters and reviews is so, that Bill, when they like um really intelligently fuck us <laughs> yes Yes, that, that's that would be psychosexual con Congress. <laughs> <laughs> psychosexual, my favorite word. So, Bill, why don't you take us on out, bud? Thank you for listening to another underrated, undersized, but got a big heart. And oh, yeah, we forgot to talk about Kingpin episode of <laughs> The Greatest Pod. <laughs> Yeah.